Uh, you hear me? Hear me now? Can you hear me now? My name is Chris Wells, and I am uh, Chief of Staff at Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality. I want to thank everybody for being here today for our uh, contracting workshop. Um, kind of give you some context. Uh, you're going to hear more a little later about the restoration program uh, as, as, uh, as a whole, but the main focus uh, for this workshop today and what we thought uh, would be beneficial would be to, uh, to help people understand uh, and try to avoid some of the contracting pitfalls uh, and some of the mistakes that we've seen some folks uh, make when we get to the contracting stage. Generally, the way this process works is that we develop project ideas, restoration project ideas, uh, they go through the, the process of, of, of receiving, obtaining funding through one of the various funding sources that you'll hear more about later. And then at some point, we reach implement the implementation stage. And, and that involves contracting, procurement, and, um, and that's sort of the, the main focus for today's workshop is to give folks a, an idea or to make sure that people understand the, the nuts and bolts of what need to be, what you need to be able to do to, to put yourself in contention when we, uh, when when we or uh, either DEQ directly or, or a, a sub recipient, uh, a funding sub recipient, uh, procures services, whatever that might be, professional services, construction services, so forth, uh, to implement a project. Um, what we want is for people to com be able to compete head to head on their merits and their capacity and their capabilities and not uh, fall subject to a, a technicality or a pitfall. And so that's what we hope uh, by the end of the day, uh, every everybody will be able to walk away from here understanding what I's need to be dotted and what T's need to be crossed. And so with that, I will um, turn it over to our to Teresa to bring up our to Sarah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got things. Sarah Tracy is going to give an overview. Um, as Chris said, my name is Sarah Tracy. I have been with DEQ uh, my entire career, um, over 20 years. Um, in fact, I don't have enough fingers and toes anymore to count. Um, but my experience is all with. Sorry, I can't see you. <laughs> my experience is all with funding programs. I started out with the SRF funding program, moved into CDBG, and now into NIFWIF. <coughs> Excuse me. And when I first heard of NIFWIF, I thought, I can't even spell NIFWIF, and why are you asking me to work on it? But I have learned a lot in the last two and a half years, and I want to share a little bit of that with you. One of the first things to remember is that when DEQ uses the term restoration, that is an umbrella term and it means all of the efforts that we are making for oil spill restoration. That includes three different funding streams. One is NIFWIF, which stands for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. The second is NERDA, NRDA, the Natural Resource Damage Assessment. And then finally, RESTORE, Resources and Economic Sustainability, Tourist Opportunities, and Reviving Economies. That tends to be what everybody latches on to, and they use restore to mean any and all restoration activities, but hopefully I can demystify that a little bit for you all today. So first, there is the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. It was set up by an act of Congress in the late 80s to act as a granting agency, but it is not a federal entity. Therefore, it does not have federal regulations. Rather, it depends on its grantees to enforce the, the laws of their state as it applies to them. And so therefore, when we procure things, when, or when our sub-grantees procure things through NIFWIP, they do not have to follow federal procurement law. I, the reason I want to make that distinction is because Melanie, in a little while, is going to be telling you all about procurement procedures. And for the state of Mississippi, when DEQ is procuring things, we treat every program and project the same but our subgrantees are not held to that same standard. There were criminal charges that resulted from the oil spill, and rather than go through a lengthy trial process and appeals process, 
BP and Transocean agreed to a settlement with the U.S. Department of Justice. That settlement created the Gulf Environmental Benefit Fund, which NIFWF oversees. <coughs> Excuse me. There will be, after all the payments are made, $2.4 billion in that fund, and of that, Mississippi will receive $356 million. We have to go through a process each year where we submit proposals for projects, and the NIFWF staff helps us to craft those in such a way that we can get their board to buy into the project and agree to it. But until the NIFWF board of directors says it's okay, we can't move forward with a project. But when we do get to move forward with projects, we have some really cool ones. Has anybody ever heard of Round Island and the project that we're doing out there? Anybody? Okay. Um, when the folks that have to dredge river channels and port channels, um, when it comes time to dredge, the challenge is where to put that material that they, they dig out. Well, we said, why don't we use that material to build marsh? And in fact, the Department of Marine Resources already has a program similar to that. This was able to just put some boots on the ground and, and add some dollars to that program. And we had the opportunity to capture material from the Port of Pascagoula, and we built uh, a 200-acre island in the Mississippi Sound. Um, if you want to get in your boat and drive, well, boat sails south of Pascagoula, you'll get to Round Island in about 15 minutes, depending on how fast your uh, motor goes. And we would love for you to go out and see it. I think you're going to be impressed when you do. However, we do ask that you don't get out of your boat. Um, one of our engineers sank to his waist when he was trying to walk on there. So it is not safe yet. It's not dry enough. But once it gets to be dry enough, we plan to shape it, and it will create um, all sorts of habitat for birds and fish and shellfish. Another exciting project that we have going on is the Oyster Restoration and Management Project. Um, we are mapping the Mississippi Sound um, to help us to understand what's going on with the reefs in that area. We are modeling the water quality of that area and of the lower Pearl River so that we can understand better how to manage um, our oyster reefs and make them more productive. Um, if you live on the water, we would love for you to become a foster parent to oysters in our oyster gardening pro um, project. And um, anybody that wants to find out more about that afterwards, please come and see me. Finally, um, one of our newest projects is the Habitat Improvement and Conservation in Turkey Creek. That's going to include some analysis, some um, stream bank stabilization and debris removal and conservation in that greenway. Next we have the NERDA program, Natural Resource Damage Assessment. And that is overseen by the NERDA Trustee Council. And you can see the members of that council on the board. One thing that may not be quite obvious from that list, when it says Department of Commerce, it is talking about NOAA. Um, most people don't tend to think of commerce as a scientific uh, department, but NOAA is a piece of that. Um, we have two pieces to NERDA. There is the early restoration, and then there is long-term restoration. Right after the oil spill happened, BP acknowledge that there would be damage to natural resources. To try and get out ahead of, um, of the process, they went ahead and pledged a certain amount of money for um, restoration projects. Of that amount, Mississippi received $112 million. We have already obligated all of that money to projects. Um, however, anytime we do have a new project that we want to put forth, the NERDA Council has to unanimously approve that project. When there was a consent decree signed last year, is that right, last year? Yeah. Um, they agreed to pay Mississippi another $183 million for all of the damage to natural resources. And that's going to be paid incrementally over 15 years. These are some examples of our active and upcoming NERDA projects. If you've been out in the Heron Bay, area recently, you've seen the new Hancock County Marsh Living Shoreline. It acts as a breakwater structure and it will, uh, the reason it's called a living shoreline is because it, it is such that little critters will attach to it and, um, and we'll have more productivity in that area. It also can eventually create marsh because the erosion that's coming behind it will build up behind it. 
Um, the Pops Ferry Causeway Park was actually in the paper today. Um, that's one of our NERDA projects, and we're doing something similar in Pascagoula with the Beach Boulevard promenade. And then within some of our other bays, we are continuing to build more living shorelines and subtitle reefs. Finally, there is the Restore program. And it is the most complex of the, the three funding streams because it is made up of five different buckets of money. Um, Mississippi did not come up with that term. Um, I guess Congress came up with that term. Um, it's not very technical, but that's what they call it. Um, bucket one and bucket five is overseen by the Department of Treasury. Buckets two and three are overseen by this Restore Council that's listed above. You'll notice that it's the exact same folks as the NERDA Council with the addition of the Corps of Engineers and the Coast Guard. The bucket number one is called the direct component, and we already know the approximate amount of money that we're getting out of that, and that's $372 million. That particular bucket has the widest range of projects to, uh, parameters. Um, we can include infrastructure in this bucket. Um, we can include tourism-focused and economic development-focused projects. Bucket number two is competitive. That's why there's a question mark. Um, I believe there's about $1.2 billion in the bucket, but Mississippi does not yet know how much of that money we will get. Bucket number three is formula-based, um, and that formula is made up of the distance from the spill itself, the miles of shoreline that were affected, and the population that was affected. Um, as you might have guessed, uh, Louisiana has the longest shoreline, so they probably got the most money, but we still get $320 million, which is not anything to sneeze at. Bucket number five is the centers of excellence. Um, each state is, is uh, putting forth a, a center of excellence to focus on science um, research related to restoration. Ours is made up of a consortium from JSU, MSU, USM, and Ole Miss. Um, you'll notice on bucket four, that we get zero dollars. NOAA is going to get about hundred and ten million dollars for their research and projects. They may choose to spend some in Mississippi, but we at DEQ and the governor's office do not have any purview over those funds. Uh, we don't know how much will get spent and on what. As you notice at the bottom, it says that it's paid incrementally over 15 years. This money was in the same consent decree as the NERDA money and um, it will be paid out. They have a pay schedule for it. The reason that I want you to, to know that is so that you realize that DEQ does not have just this big pile of money that we're sitting on and hoarding and, and just giving out willy-nilly. We have to, to follow a very distinct process in order to get the money actually released to the state. And um, <coughs> Melanie, did you want me to talk about that at all? No. Okay. Um, there are funded priority lists and, and multi-implementation, multi-year implementation plans and state expenditure plans and all these different pieces, parts that, that DEQ has to, to step through before we can get approval on these projects. So all that to say, even though it's going to get paid out incrementally over 15 years, it's going to take us more than 15 years to spend all of that money. And that is... Um, Right now, all we have are Bucket 1 projects that are active because we are still working with the Restore Council and with Treasury to move the other buckets forward. Um, but you can see that it's a wide variety of projects. Um, one that's not on here but is coming is the, um, the fiber optic cable uh, for high-speed internet here on the coast. Um, what does that have to do with an oil spill? Probably nothing, but it will help to develop this corridor for businesses to improve and people to, to move to the coast and invest in the coast. And now I'm going to turn it over to Teresa, who is going to facilitate our contracting portion. Next we have Melanie Green. Melanie is uh, account director for the Office of Restoration for MDEQ, and she will be discussing the contract procedures and the procurement process. <coughs> so I have to say this part may be a little bit of a struggle just because of what I've got to put on the slide, but before I get started, um, 
I'm the accounting director for the Office of Restoration, and one of the hats that I wear is the procurement officer for the various solicitations that we have. Um, what Teresa didn't say is, or what's missing is, I actually have a team now. So I have Teresa Ree and then Coretta Jones, raise your hand, Coretta, <laughs> that are part of my team, and um, I've got them helping me today so that that you all will start seeing their faces and hopefully sooner rather than later they'll be able to um, start serving as procurement officers on the upcoming solicitations that we have. So that being said, if you'll just bear with me just a second, uh, for contract services we pretty much have three different types of solicitations that we do. One is an invitation for bid. Um, that procurement, typically a contractor, is selected based on lowest price. The scope of work is equal um, across the board. We lay that out, and then whoever has the lowest price, uh, lowest to best price, um, actually gets awarded the contract. The second type we have is the request for proposals. And when we, when we issue a request for proposal, a contract is awarded based on the combination of the proposal, which is unique, um, and then the, the associated price. So, the third one is the um, request for qualifications. And when we issue a request for qualifications, which is mostly what we've been doing in the Office of Restoration over the last couple of years, those contracts are awarded to the offer based on qualifications. Uh, I guess in the past year or so, we have gotten some new regulations from the um, PSCRB, Personal Services Contract Review Board, regarding requests for qualifications and now there's actually a two-step process on contracts that are under their purview. Uh, the first part is based on qualifications and then if you meet the minimum scoring on qualifications you move to the second part which has a, a pricing factor built into it. Can you just get that off? So with that being said, um, there are some services that aren't under purview of the contract review board and those are engineering services and auditing services. But DEQ has put into practice um, actually putting out procurements competing against um, having a competition for that work. So <coughs> that being said, those those um, contracts are awarded based on qualifications and then the agency after selection negotiates the the rates with the um, contractor that was selected and then if for some reason we couldn't come to agreement on the rates then we would move to the contractor that was uh, second on the list okay so I'm going to pull up an example of an RFQ, a recent RFQ that we did for Land Surveyor, and we're going to walk through a couple of things. There are some pitfalls that I, that I actually see on a lot of solicitations. And so one of, or my main goal of, of this presentation is just to sort of explain what we're, what we're doing, uh, what we're looking for, tell you some of the pitfalls that we see, and then hopefully when you all uh, participate in these solicitations, you won't make those same mistakes that others have, have made in the past. So Sarah, I think we're going to All right. So here we're going to tell you, you know, a, a brief summary of what we're doing, what we're looking for, um, the types of activities that we are seeking services for. Let me scroll up a little bit. We're going to tell you what the minimum qualifications are, give you an idea of what the period of performance will be um, right here. No, right here. Okay. So the mandatory requirements are very important. They they're sort of the minimum requirements. You got you have to meet these requirements in order to for us to even accept your proposal that you submit or your SOQ in this case. The company information, you can scroll up just a little bit. 
the company information you would you would think is pretty straightforward but many times people fail to complete every item that's on here particularly scroll down just a hair no I guess up then that's okay. <laughs> all right I mean sometimes we just people don't they don't put their email address on there well that's one of the requirements so when you are going through this mandatory requirements list and comparing this list to your actual SOQ, please just check off, literally go through and check off these items to make sure that they can be found in your SOQ when you submit it. And, and just another point, it, it doesn't hurt to say the average number of employees over the past three years was X you can be that explicit and it helps the it helps me and my team and the review team acknowledge that you have fully complied with with the mandatory requirement on that the next item is the project plan management we typically have can you shrink that down just a little bit so we can there you go here this is this is how you're going to do whatever it is that we're asking you to do and so we you know, previously we said these are the items we want you to do. In this section, we're asking you to tell us how you're going to do that. And I would just encourage you that when you're looking at when you're looking at the SOQ, your SOQ for compliance with this requirement, please compare this to the scope of work that is listed in in Part One. And I would encourage you to get someone else to read it as well to make sure that that it is saying what you want it to say, that it's easy for a reader to walk through exactly what you plan to do and how that's going to achieve the services that we're looking for. Uh, one of the, I guess, point, one of the comments, or I'll say comments, one of the comments that I typically hear when the evaluation team members are going through a solicitation is that, you know, sometimes it's a hard read, it wasn't coherent, they told us what they could do, they told us they could do it, but they didn't tell us how they can do it. So they really haven't convinced me that they can do it because they didn't tell me how they were going to do it. So ask yourself those questions so that, um, so that you'll have a, a, a better quality of an SOQ and just an, if it's an easier read for the evaluation team member, then I think that your scores will reflect that as well. Can you scroll down just a little bit more? The, right here, the project team resources and resumes. Um, we're going to ask you to give us a list of the people that you expect, or the key, the key personnel that you expect to work on these projects. Um, some project teams are, you know, one firm with their staff. Some are multiple firms pulled together, pull their resources together. And just when you do that, make sure that you're listing the key personnel, that you're giving resumes for anybody that's on that list. We don't intend for you to give us your whole organization's resume, but the key personnel that are identified um, on this project, we would like them to be identified. And then the resumes, as well as what their roles and responsibilities are going to be. Let me scroll on down. No, right there. Um, experience with projects of similar scope and references. Again, just like the company information, I would encourage you to go through your SOQ and check off each of these items, particularly number three, because this is where most of the mistakes happen. But check it off for each proje project that you list to make sure that all the information that we're asking for is in your SOQ. Professional licenses and registrations. Most people don't miss this one, so, but I'll just say, you know, if you have multiple firms, we need those licenses for the firms and for the individuals. Um, we'll need those as well. The certificate of good standing, we actually do have, um, they're getting better, but we actually do have a lot of issues with this one. Um, in order to do business with us, you have to be in good standing with the state of Mississippi. And so 
we put the burden on the contractor, the offer, to uh, let us know that they are in good standing, and by that we ask you to submit a, a certificate of good standing that is dated within 60 days of the, the deadline of the submittal. On that one, I'll tell you the thing that we miss, that gets missed the most, is that people will go on the website, everything's electronic, websites, easy access, but people will go to the website and they will print out, they'll, you know, they'll do the search on the Secretary of State's website and then they'll print out this piece of paper that says they're in good standing. Well, that is not an official certificate of good standing. So when we say official certificate of good standing, it actually says that on the, um, the certificate. And that's what we're looking for on that. The price. So this one is, um, <coughs> this is, for an RFQ, this is sort of new, and so people are still feeling their way through this. What we are asking for in this pricing information, particularly for an RFQ, well, for an RFQ only, um, you, I'm going to use engineers as an example. If we're if we have a service like land surveyor, where engineers can engineering firms can put in can provide the services so they can put in for the solicitation, then we have to consider them as an offer on these types of projects. And when we do that, they are prevented from, um, help me, what's the right word? Competing based on price. And so we have a two-step process, and the first step is the qualifications, and I'm going to show you that. And then based on your score, you de you're deemed qualified or, or not qualified to move to step two. When we get to step two, we can start looking at the pricing information. But we can't look at that pricing information until we do that evaluation, um, that qualification evaluation. And so because of that, we've asked that when you submit your, your SOQ to us, that in a separate envelope pri uh, marked pricing documentation, that one, that it's in a separate sealed envelope because we don't want the evaluation team members to be able to see that pricing information until they've actually scored it. So number one, first and foremost, put that in a separate envelope and label it pricing documentation. The second pitfall that I see on the pricing information is they're not, the offers are not complying with what we're asking for. And in this particular, their rate sheet, their rate schedule doesn't reflect the requirements of this provision. And on this particular provision, we have asked for hourly rate for personnel, and that hourly rate should reflect any cost that you anticipate. And then we said we would pay for mileage and we'll pay for travel expense, meal expenses, according to the state travel policy. So those, other than the hourly rate, <coughs> the mileage and the meals are the only two other items that we'll pay for. But a lot of times what we're seeing is we'll get the hourly rate, we'll get the mileage, we'll get the meals, but then we'll see lodging, we'll see boat usage, um, ATV, whatever. We'll get your equipment list. Well, we've already said that you got to factor that into your hourly rate, so I don't need a personnel rate schedule and then an equipment rate schedule because that can't be considered for this solicitation. So I just encourage you to really read what we're asking for and then follow that accordingly. All right, you can go to the next one. Maybe Weeby. So we do have a Maybe Weeby requirement, um, minority business and women business enterprises. The there's a couple of things that I want to talk about on this one. Sarah, can you scroll down to section, I think it's 21 on here. The state of Mississippi, we can't, we can't show preference when we're selecting contractors. And so we are not allowed to select a firm or show preference to a, a firm that is a, uh, a maybe or a weeby. 
but there, well, before I say this, a lot of times with federal monies, um, or actually with any solicitation, you know, we have offers read this provision right here and they'll, they'll send me a question that says, what's your set aside? What are your goals? There's a perception out there that since some of the funding coming in for this Office of Restoration, that they're federal dollars, that somehow there's some set aside. Well, there's not a set aside. There are goals. There are the six affirmative steps that we have to follow that are listed on here. But there's not a set aside. And, and it's against state law for us to show preference for that. So what DEQ has done is um, created a policy to promote and encourage minority business enterprises and women business enterprise um, contracts. Or, you know, subrecipients. Sometimes, uh, a lot of times we'll see a prime contractor come in with the subrecipient that's a, that's a maybe, the subcontractor is a maybe weeby. So this section goes through the different steps that we require our contractors to do. And so if you'll just kind of slowly scroll through this. <coughs> you can keep going. These are the things that we require um, our contractors to consider when they're trying to, you know, decide whether or not to subcontract work. You keep going. Now, this item B, it says, if applicable, offer shall supply DQ with, um, with proof. I missed something. Scroll back up. There's a list. We require you to provide a list of people that you solicit. Um, in the past, this requirement has been uh, has been missed or not fully complied with. And so, what we have done is created a form, and you can scroll down. Yeah, a couple more pages. So, we provided a form to make it a little bit easier for everyone to comply with. Here you go. So what we, this is an actual attachment that we expect to see on every, or that we are requiring on every solicitation. And on here, we want you to tell us who you solicited. <coughs> we want to know that you're, you know, that you've considered the, you know, the requirements that were in the previous section. And if you made a phone call to someone to see what services they can provide, then we, we want you to tell us that here. Um, we're not saying you have to pick someone, but we would we, we strongly encourage you to please reach out to to maybe Weeby firms or organizations and um, find out what services they can provide and if there's something that if, if there's something there that you can utilize in your proposal. Scroll on down. This page right here sometimes gets skipped. Um, people see the list and then they finish the list and and then stop. So here, um, this is the second page of that form. You have to check one of these boxes. Go ahead and scroll down, Sarah. I think there's a signature line on this one. No? Okay. All right, you can go back up to the mandatory requirements. The next, uh, the next item in the mandatory requirements is the offers affidavit. This is also an attachment that we provide in the RFQ. The most common mistake on the offers affidavit is uh, failure to get the affidavit notarized. So just again, go through this list and check that off. Check it to your SOQ. Make sure it's notarized before you send before you turn it in. Uh, item J is the non-resident contractor. Uh, we don't see folks miss this often, but it has been missed. Um, if you are an out-of-state contractor or if your um, organization is headquartered out-of-state, then you're deemed an out-of-state firm. And if that's the case, then you need to provide the um, the state bid law for that state for which your organization is headquartered in. Okay. 
acknowledgement of amendments. If we have to issue an amendment, and I'm going to go ahead and do response to inquiries too since they're very similar. If we have to issue an amendment or a response to inquiries on a solicitation, uh, we, we are required by the Personal Services Contract Review Board, um, we are required to, uh, that our offers acknowledge that they are submitting an SOQ and that they have, that complies with the amendment, but they also, they have come back and said that response to inquiries are deemed um, amendments as well. So when we issue an, an amendment or a response to inquiries, we put a signature <coughs> line on there and where you're acknowledging such and those documents need to be attached to your SOQ. The most common mistake on that is, um, or mistakes, I'll have people email them to me and if you email it to me and fail to include it in your SOQ then I will consider that. But my preference is that you attach that to your SOQ when you submit your SOQ. Okay. Um, the evaluation process, I'm going to go through this, spend a, a few minutes on this, and then we'll quickly jump down to our, uh, I think the insurance requirements, the next point that we'll go to. So the evaluation procedure, we are required by state law to tell you how we are going to select a contractor. And so most definitely pay close attention to this section in the RFQ. Um, this is this is what we have to, these are things that we have to do in order to make the selection. The first step that we have to do, before you go down, well no, that's it, determination of acceptability is good. Um, we have to determine whether you are acceptable or not. Um, you're either acceptable, potentially acceptable, or unacceptable. If you do not meet the mandatory requirements, we, uh, we can deem you unacceptable because you didn't fully comply with the mandatory requirements. If you, um, sometimes we have some potentially acceptable, we may have to request clarification on something to make that determination. Otherwise, our preference is that for every SOQ that we receive, that we can deem them acceptable. Hence is why we're having this training, this workshop today. Um, we spend a lot of time and effort on solicitations, and I know you all spend a lot of time and resources uh, responding to those solicitations. So the last thing that we want to do is deem your SOQ or your proposal as unacceptable because you didn't meet the mandatory requirements. Scroll down. Mm -hmm. um, for RFQs, RFPs seem to be a little bit more straightforward. We tell you exactly what you're going to do and how many points are associated with that. We do the same thing with the RFQ, it's just we do it in, in two steps. So the overall quality of the SOQ is the first criteria that, that the evaluation team is going to review your SOQ on. And I'll just say this goes back to the conversation that, or the point I made earlier about um, making sure that your uh, project plan management, I think was how it was worded, that it coincides with the scope of work so that someone reading this can can compare what you have to the SOQ and you are proving that you can do it and how you've done it. Um, all of these things here uh, are taken into consideration. The completeness of the response goes back to being able to do that comparison. If they can easily make that comparison, then they can easily uh, determine that you um, can fully fulfill the role that we're looking for. Record of past performance of similar projects. <clears throat> I would encourage you to get familiar with the project, um, the details of the project. If you can, if you can take your past experiences and compare that directly to the work that we are trying to do then that usually, that, that's favorable. It lets us know that you understand the conditions that we're working in, um, that you have the experience in that area. Um, and then again, make sure that when you are listing your projects of, sim you know, of past performance that you go through that checkbox that we discussed earlier to make sure that um, we have the phone number, we have the name, all that for those reference projects. 
The offer's ability to provide required services, um, this is that management plan. In your management plan, tell us how you're going to devote those resources to our agency to feel, fulfill your obligation if you're selected. The, the thing I see kind of lacking the most would probably be the financial resources. Um, sometimes it's the equipment. There's not an emphasis on you proving that you have the uh, equipment and then, the, again, the financial resources to support it. So a lot of people spend a good bit of their 30-page limit on personnel and, and kind of leave out the other stuff. So. Um, this particular number four offers expertise in working on a variety of parcel types. Um, for this solicitation, we were going to be going over different terrain and or we're going to be evaluating different terrain. And so we needed a land surveyor that has done the various types of um, landscape that, that we're going to be dealing with. That being said, most solicitations have something that's very project specific. And so I would just encourage you that if we're looking, if, if the evaluation criteria has to do with variety, then don't tell us that you built, um, you know, five like products. To, you know, if you built five hospitals, that's great, but tell us you built a hospital and that you built a road and, you know, give us some variety there so that we can see that you're not specialized in one thing. Um, on this, again, on this solicitation, it was a two-step process, and if we have to do a two-step process, typically our minimum point um, criteria or qualified, in order to be qualified, you have to have a minimum of 50 points. I'll just say it that way. If you don't score 50, then we're not even going to open up your price because you didn't meet the qualifications. But if you score, if you score 50 points or higher, then you'll go into step two will open up the pricing documentation and then the evaluation team will look at your rate schedule, again, that it has personnel and travel for mileage and meals only, no equipment items. They will evaluate your pricing documentation and then score it. And then we are required to rank these. And this particular solicitation, we, um, we actually were going to have more than one contractor on our list of of um, organizations that could provide these services so we didn't have to pick one but on most solicitations we're just picking one so if this one were, if that were the case on this one we would score them rank them and then we would just pick the highest ranked um, offer you can keep going most of this is just you can keep going I'm going to skip through most of this because it's self-explanatory. We don't really get a lot of questions on it. Um, go to the additional information. Well, acceptance period, I'll just say I don't have issues with people submitting late proposals. I think everyone knows that that is a hard <coughs> deadline. And if you come in after the time, that's listed here that your your SIQ would be rejected and returned. So I don't have many issues with that. I just wanted to point out that that is a very hard deadline. Okay. okay. Right here, Sarah. So additional information here we we just kind of tell you some additional things. Most of the time what you see here is all we're, um, all we put. But what I want to point out is that we give you a deadline to get your questions in. The reason we do that is it has been brought to my attention that it, it typically takes, depending on the type of solicitation, that it may take a week for a, an organization, or five days to a week for an organization to compile their SIQ and get it to the print shop in order to get that back in a timely manner to meet the deadline. So in an effort to um, help you all with that, we set a deadline for uh, questions. Once that deadline passes, if there has not been an amendment that extends that deadline, that is a hard deadline because we're going to issue a response to inquiries and 
we, we try to give you the date on that so that you'll know that on, on this case, once April 17th passed, April 18th, if your SOQ is ready, you can send it to the print shop and meet your deadline. So we try to tell you when is the when the last time you'll hear from us will be, just so that you can tie up any loose ends on your part and and, and do whatever it is that you need to do. It never fails that I all. It never fails that someone starts pulling their SOQ together after that deadline, and then they have a question, and it may be something as simple as, "Can I?" type on the the tabs and I can't answer it. If the, if the question comes in after the deadline and we've issued the response to inquiries, then that's a hard um, that's a hard deadline. I cannot answer it and I'll send you an email that says thank you for your inquiry but I, I, I can't respond. And the reason we do that is we have to keep all things equal. So we can't have we can't answer questions to someone and then not give another offer that same advantage. So you can't call me and ask me that question and me answer it and then this other contractor that had the same question, they don't even know. They may have had that same question, but anyway, we have to keep everything equal. So that's why we do that is to keep keep all things equal. Debriefing request. We can stop there. So, just real quickly, this is something that's it's been around for a couple of years now. And while there's not pitfalls on this, because uh, this is a this is an activity that the agency has to provide if requested, but it's an opportunity for offers to to get a debriefing. I really don't see a lot of people ask for this, but it gives you an opportunity to see how you compared to others, um, ask questions if, you, if your SOQ or your proposal had any weaknesses or deficiencies, then this is the time to find that out. So if, you, if you're wanting to improve what you're submitting to agencies uh, to improve your, um, your SOQs, then please request the debriefing. It's something that's free, that's an offer to you that we're required to do. We're prepared to uh, respond to those requests. So I really encourage you that if you put in an offer and whether you're, we've had people that were selected come and ask for them just because they wanted to see areas where they can improve. Um, and we've had people, you know, obviously that, that didn't get selected ask for them. But, it's there for you for your benefit, so I, I encourage you to make those requests. There's usually a time restriction. Once a contract is, once a contractor is selected, then I'll send a letter out to to those that were not selected, letting them know that um, that they weren't selected. Once you receive that letter, this says 10 days. So once you see receive that letter, you have 10 days to notify me that you would like to, to have a debriefing. And then we'll get, we try to schedule those as quickly as possible. Um, they're usually scheduled within a week, two weeks top. So <coughs> again, just please request those if, if you're interested in proving, improving your SOQs. You can keep going. It's the insurance requirement. Most of the standard terms and conditions, I don't, I don't get a lot of questions about, just to be honest with you, during the, the procurement process, because it's actually the contractor that is selected that has to comply with the standard terms and conditions that are in the contract. Most of them are pretty straightforward. Most people don't have issues with them. But once we get into the contract award, um, there's, there is certain information that we have to gather from you in order to move forward with the contract. And one of those is the insurance. We have to have a certificate of insurance that complies with whatever the requirement is. Insurance is different for project and entities, so it's very unique to the solicitation. Here we go. And while I know what this says, um, 
I'm not an attorney, so I'm going to turn it over to the attorneys to walk you through what the actual insurance requirements are for the solicitations. Tabitha Levy. <laughs> <laughs> she did good timing. I think she's got a PowerPoint. I think too, she did. So, um, we'll just go forward. Maybe we'll have a, a PowerPoint to show you okay. here in just a minute. My name is Grant Pettis. I'm a lawyer with Balch and Bingham. And it's good to see some familiar faces here today. Um, let's talk about insurance, right? Pretty, pretty riveting topic. <coughs> what we have seen is that even for the best laid proposals, Insurance is something that a lot of folks uh, don't look at until the very end, until they're selected. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that, but primarily because most of you are in business already, right? So you have some insurance coverage, you think it's pretty standard, and the details of what MDEQ is requiring may kind of slip until you get that notice of award, and then it becomes a, a difficulty in meeting it uh, and scurrying with, with time constraints, so to speak, to get it in place. So, um, why, why do we need insurance? Why is DEQ going to require it? Because we're only going to hire people that, you know, do the best work, right? Well, I mean, we're human beings and stuff happens. Stuff happens. You've heard that before. And so, from our standpoint as an owner, as a state agency, it's only prudent to know that the people that we're working with are covered, covered adequately, and that DEQ is covered as well. Um, we do have some legal requirements. Uh, the law is pretty basic when it comes to construction and saying what a contractor has to have. But if it is a construction project over 5,000, which all of our construction projects so far have been, uh, then you have to have a CGL policy. It's a commercial general liability or a comprehensive general liability policy of at least a million dollars. That's the basic legal requirement. And again, uh, in operating you know, your business, you probably already have that in place, I would think. Um, given the work and the projects that DEQ has had so far and anticipates in the future, uh, we have additional insurance requirements. I need and to give you something. Sorry. Can you all hear me? Well, there's a recording. Podiums. <laughs> okay. Everybody can still hear me? We'll get a sharp looking PowerPoint here for you in just a minute. So what, what, what I don't have for you today, is that me? Wake up. I don't have a, a gecko for you today. I don't have a Aflac duck for you today. Okay, but the coverages that we're gonna talk about they, they don't ever advertise those on TV anyway. What I will tell you is that if you do happen to be a successful contractor uh, selected for some project or service, uh, if you don't get your insurance right and you don't turn it in, we're going to be squawking at you like the Aflac duck, okay? Because it's very important. It's very important because things happen. Um, Tab, are we ready? Is this our deal here? We on? Okay. We're good. So we, we talked about that. Uh, workers' comp. What you're going to see in all of our solicitations is that, in all of DEQ solicitations, is that it says workers' comp according to statutory limits. Now, what, what does that mean? If you happen to be a business with five or less employees, you do not actually have to carry workers' comp, okay? Um, I suspect that most of you probably have over five employees, and it is a requirement that, that you do have. Um, and, it, and then, as far as what you actually are required to pay in premiums for workers' comp, your insurance carrier is going to tell you that based off of the number of employees you have, the type of work that you're going to be doing, all of that factors into the cost. In DEQ solicitations, this requirement is part of your overhead. So it's not something that is going to be charged separately or that you bill back separately. It's going to be built into your prices. 
whether they be hourly for a service or whether it be a, a, a flat price bid. So just keep that in mind. Uh, also, subcontractors. Uh, it is a general requirement for DEQ that not only the prime contractor carry the required insurance, but that its subcontractors working for it have the same insurance coverage. Okay, so can everybody see that? Pretty legible. This is the standard types of coverage that you are going to see required in a DEQ solicitation. Workers' comp and employees' liability coverage. Um, I, I don't want to bore you with going through what these are, if, if you know. Does anybody have any questions really about workers' comp or employee liability coverage, what it's for? I mean, it's, it's basically covering you for any type of injury to your employees while they're in the scope of their employment. And then employers' liability um, covers things that workers' comp doesn't cover in the same realm, so to speak. So with, with workers' comp, uh, what you have covered are medical benefits to your employees for injuries as well as lost wages. And then employers' liability will usually cover any kind of claims associated with that type of injury outside of um, lost wages or medical benefits. Say your employee sues you, okay, and the cost of defense is something you're having to pay. That's where employers' liability would come into play. Longshoremen and Harbor Workers Compensation Insurance. Now you may not have seen this before, uh, but we do live in a, in a coastal area. If you've ever worked on the water for a state or federal, federal agency before, you've probably had to do this. This is a derivative of a federal act that says <clears throat> if you're working in navigable waters of the U.S. or you're working on something real close to it, like a port, a pier, a wharf, something of that nature, then that federal act applies and you have to have that type coverage. Um, DEQ's projects, many of them so far as you can imagine, have been in the marine environment. Many are anticipated to be in the marine environment going forward. And so depending on a particular project that you may be interested in, be looking at the requirements because it's very likely that you'll be required to have longshore and harbor workers insurance. Comprehensive general liability insurance. Now, if you're in business, uh, chances are you have this kind of policy. What does it insure you for? It protects you uh, from claims for third parties for injury, personal injury, or property damage. Contractor pollution liability insurance. Um, so this is basically a CGL type coverage but for environmental pollution type damages. So if you're working on a project and there's the potential for there to be an environmental impact due to the work, uh, you're probably going to see this requirement in the solicitation uh, just because we want you to be protected uh, but we also want to be protected as well. Auto liability policy pretty you know pretty standard um, you know we require you to have that coverage not just for your own vehicles but for those that are used in the course and scope of the performance of your work that you do not own and those things happen I know you know when you're trying to figure it out in a vacuum when is that situation ever going to arise well it, I mean it happens you know one day you're on the job site you've had to call in a subcontractor it's a vehicle you don't own the two of you end up having to go run an errand you get in the car and you get in an accident somebody's hurt you know, you got to make sure that the proper coverage is there. Errors and emissions, professional liability. Um, you're going to see this in the construction contract sometimes, not always. Uh, when you're doing pure construction work, this is not something that you would normally see. But given the way that some of the construction projects have been designed and the requirements of them, for instance, surveying requirements uh, at the end of completion of parts of the construction work. That surveying is a professional um, professional service that takes someone with a professional license to perform and um, you know God forbid if something were wrong with it and it caused damage you would need a professional liability policy to cover that instance. Um, that's something you're going to see most often in professional service solicitations, not so much construction, but we do have those occasions in construction where it matters and where we need it. Okay, any questions so far? Yes, ma'am. If 
the, the coverage that you see is, and, and what you're going to see in a solicitation, uh, is going to be based off of the scope of the project. So now, there could certainly be occasions where um, MDEQ may consider after solicitation is out whether certain coverages are required. And so I would encourage you, if you have questions about it, you know, to ask those during the solicitation process, you know, for it to be considered. But it, it's generally going to be based off of the scope of the project and the magnitude of what's involved in the project and the work involved as opposed to the size of the business. Tab? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, based on the size of your policy, you can determine all that old factors all together, right? I'm Insurance policy. Yes, sir. Say that for me again. Based on the amount of coverage that you carry, all this can be involved uh, you can listen on your policy, right? Yeah, so these type coverages, um, you know, usually you're going to see those by some different carriers. You know, it's 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 rare for a single business to carry all of this all the time. And so, let's say there were a project, a construction project, that required all of this. I would suspect that almost everybody in the room would have to go procure at least one of these type coverages to comply. Uh, you may have three or four already, but you know, in order to meet the requirements of the project, you would have to. You know, get additional coverage. Did I answer your question? Somewhat. Like if you carry a ten million dollar book of insurance and you know it's a, and you can just I mean as long as you got enough coverage in there, you can a lot of these different uh, type of uh incidents. Well these these insurance policies cover different types of damages and different scenarios. And so if you had $10 million worth of coverage in your CGL policy, that would not necessarily suffice for the coverage in other areas like workers' comp or contractor pollution liability. Um, now, if you had $10 million in CGL, then obviously you've met the requirement for CGL, but all of these types of insurance cover different situations. And so, correct. That's, that's correct. Very, very different. Very different situation. And even on water, you can have a different situation depending on whether it involves the captain and his crew on a boat or other workers. There's this thing called the Jones Act, you know, which is different than uh, longshoremen and harbor workers compensation insurance. So it, it can be a little complicated. My name is Tabitha Baum. I'm on a legal counsel with MDEQ. Um, just to kind of continue on from what Brant was saying. Now, the coverages he was just talking about, that also kind of uh, relates to the services contracts. And so, so those were what typically you see in construction contracts. But when it comes to other type of services, you'll see something similar. So like the coverages with the CGL or the auto, those are typical things that you'll see also carry over into the services contracts. Now, there are certain um, things which will prompt the errors and omissions. So if it's an engineering, uh, we're, we're procuring for engineering services, you gotta expect that we will be asking for that same coverage for professional uh, errors and omissions and professional liability insurance. That'll be used again, it'll be a requirement again. Um, same thing for accounting. Um, those professions that have professional uh, titles or labels next to them, we will of course require those insurance coverages. Okay, what you'll see typically in all of the contract, uh, all of our contract requirements with insurance, you'll see that we will request that MDEQ needs to be named as an additional insured on your policies. Now, there's some exceptions. Um, one would be uh, we ask for a vicarious liability rider on top of your uh, errors and omissions, because typically. Um, Insurance companies or riders, our insurance companies will not put um, those that are typically um, not the professional on the coverage, but they will write a vicarious liability rider to then have a the agency covered. 
in that instance. Another one is uh, subrogation. Um, you'll see that we'll ask for a waiver of subrogation and your workers comp, uh, workers comp and um, comp policy and um, uh, some of your other policies to basically protect the agency um, from the insurance company and stepping into the insurer's uh, shoes and coming after another party, which would be ultimately MDEQ. So that's why we asked for a waiver of subrogation. Um, and all of your insurance policies have to be for primary coverage. Um, that's just how, what we require. Another thing is endorsements. Um, say for instance, for additional insured, you must provide, if you're your policies currently do not have a blanket additional insured or cover us. Um, you will, we will need to see proof that you have added MDEQ as an additional insured by providing an endorsement. An endorsement is a change in your policy um, and that usually comes, it's not the certificate of insurance and we'll get to that in a second, but it's actually an, a change to the policy which will show another, basically it's another form that outlines the additions that we're asking for. Um, in our insurance requirements, we also ask for, or not insurance requirements, in our contracts, we typically ask for, indem uh, well, we always ask for indemnification. And it's different than insurance. Insurance covers you if you do something wrong, but indemnification actually, um, basically what you're saying is MDQ has no liability for my actions and you basically will litigate for us that we are not we are not the responsible parties. Um, and that r arises out of anything that the contract, uh, contractor does on behalf of MDEQ. So in d just what I was talking about, endorsements and certificates, what's the difference? Um, like I said, endorsements are a change to your actual policy. That'll show us the additional insured. So it'll say, the new provision will say additional insured and this is who we cover on an additional short insured. This is kind of like what it looks like. Instead of it being a certificate of insurance, it actually says additional insured, and then up above it, it'll say an endorsement to your policy, and then it'll have the policy number. This is your typical certificate of insurance, which we will have every single time that you'll provide us, um, and that'll tell us all your coverages, what, um, you know, what limits you have, um, and then, again, um, if you have any endorsements, that's what we'll receive additionally for our other contract requirements. Now, uh, can you go back one more time? Okay, on that one I'm gonna. So yes, that's next. <laughs> okay, so just, I know you can't really read it, but I just wanna give you a heads up, and this is why we ask for endorsements. Right up at the top of the certificate of insurance, it says this does not substitute for any endorsement that may be needed for your policy. So you can label us down here as a certificate holder, MDQ, NIFWF, whoever it is, but right up at the top it tells us that the insurance, uh, or the insurance, um, agent, or insurance company is not liable for any endorsements that are needed that haven't been processed. So in order for us to be okay and stamp, stamp approved on your insurance requirements, we need an endorsement because your certificate basically caveats that. So that's kind of why that comes up. Yeah, sure. On this point, a lot of agents will tell you that that certificate of insurance is fine to show that you've got the required coverage. And they may feel that way and may have done that hundreds of times, but we're telling you that's not going to be okay. Okay, when it comes to the things that we require uh, to be uh, named as an additional insured, for the insurance to be primary coverage for DEQ, for the waiver of subrogation, we're going to need to see the endorsements for that. Um, because that's the way it that's the way we need it due to that disclaimer at the very top um, I've had to be in litigation before over that disclaimer and whether it was valid or not so I'm, I'm telling you make sure you get the endorsements okay so there's a lot of considerations when you're thinking of entering into uh, or providing a response to one of our solicitations uh, one is if if these insurance requirements are something that you're going to have to go out and get additional changes to your policy, you may need to think about what do I need, how long is it going to take,
because you have to go talk to your insurance company and it could take for a waiver subrogation it could take a couple weeks it could take a month um, it's just being aware and that's kind of why we have this contracting workshop is to make you all aware of what the typical insurance requirements will ask for um, because not only will that be taken into consideration when we execute a contract, but that also de de determines how long it's gonna take for you to have your contract executed. Or for a construction contract, we're not gonna issue a notice to proceed until you've checked off every single thing for insurance. Um, that's just one of the things that we have to have in place before you start work. Um, and the same thing with service contracts. If you don't have your insurance in check, we're not going to execute the contract. You, you, we'll send it to you all for execution and you'll provide, typically a contractor will provide their executed version of the contract with the insurances and then we do our review before we execute that portion of the contract. So just as a time perspective, knowing when you'll need to approach your insurance, when you'll need to, uh, what and how that affects how the contract will be executed in the timeline there. Another thing um, is maintaining your coverage throughout the contract. Uh, of course, uh, you need to be able to be monitoring all your insurance um, and then all of your, I mean, all your insurance policies and when they expire and you must submit it to the agency before it expires. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure I don't really have to say it, but if you don't, if you have an expired insurance, expired insurance, you're now violating the contract. So you, it, not only for the coverage purposes of making sure that everybody's covered, we don't have to worry too much about liability or we have something in place for protections, but it's also a contract perspective, from a contract um, liability perspective. Anything else? Anybody have any questions? Well, you going into the Q&A session or questions? Oh, just about insurance, but yeah, but no, okay. <coughs> okay, good, nobody's asking. So one of the other questions that I get is um, how to find out about the solicitations. And quite often I get, can y'all hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. So quite often I get asked, um, how did I find out about the solicitations? And I'll tell you that you can, you can email me and you can ask me when things are going to be released and I can't tell you because I can't tell, um, I can't tell one contractor that a solicitation is going to hit the street Monday and not tell another one. So we ha again, we have to keep all things equal. So you can ask that question and I will respectfully tell you that I can't answer that. So it's my preference that you don't ask me that question. So I don't like telling people no, but I will. Um, so that being said, there are a few places that you can go to to find out how, sorry, there are a few places you can go to to get updates on our solicitations. Um, our restore.ms website, if I can type, is one place. Um, there's, if you have not already signed up to receive notifications from us, I would encourage you to go to our restore.ms website and there is a section down here that says um, sign up to receive email updates about restoration news and then also to receive text messages. If you will sign up on, in those two um, boxes there or click that box and sign up to receive the emails and the text. The day that we advertise, we advertise in the Clarion Ledger, and these projects are down here on the coast. So we also, um, let me stand up. We also advertise in the Sun Herald. So the day that the solicitation runs in the Clarion Ledger and the Sun Herald, we also will post the solicitation to the Restore.ms website. Um, but we also send out an email blast. So. 
we put it on the Restore.ms website, but then that puts it on you to go out there and look at it if you're not paying attention. But if you'll sign up to receive the emails and the text messages, then when we send, we call it an email blast. So when we send the email blast out, um, notifying everyone that we've released a solicitation, then you'll automatically get those. So it, put, it puts the push on us to notify you. So I strongly encourage you to uh, visit our website and sign up if you haven't done so already. The other thing I get asked um, is how, like we're, we have um, a subgrant for the <coughs> Mississippi Aquarium, the city of Gulfport is going to be a subrecipient on that project. And so a lot of people are wanting to know how can they, how can they do work on that project? Well, DEQ is the recipient, the city of Gulfport is the subrecipient. And so the city of Gulfport is actually responsible for any procurement related to that project not DEQ. So I would encourage you to look, um, again, going back to our restore.ms website, I would encourage you to check out our, the plans that are made available, like we had the restore plans, let me go to the multi-year implementation plan. This tells you um, what projects we have out there, who the subrecipients are, and the reason I'm pointing you to that is that it tells you what type of activity is being funded, who is going to be implementing that project, and then the dollar amount associated with that project. So if we're building, um, or if we're funding the construction of an aquarium, then you and you know it's the city of Gulfport doing that, then I would encourage you to call the city of Gulfport and find out what, how they advertise. Um, they have to they do have to follow federal procurement standards which includes advertisement so reach out to the different subrecipients that are anticipated to receive restore act funds and find out what efforts they go through and how you can find out um, from them when those procurement opportunities are available I think that's, that's all I have <laughs> okay We're ahead of schedule, so I think, I think we're good. So um, what we're going to do now is open up the floor. If you have any questions regarding what you've just heard, um, which has been about the insurance requirements as well as about the contracting procedures, and uh, Melanie also talked about our procurement process at the agency, now would be the time to ask those questions. So the floor is open. Yes, sir. I just showed you the restore. Oh, okay. And uh, on the SOQs, you've mentioned a certificate of good standing in the state of Mississippi. And it's not just a printout from the website. So is, does the website indicate how to get an actual certificate? Yes, on there? Whose website? Secretary, Secretary of State. The Secretary of State's website, oh, not yeah. DEQ's website. If you have any okay. Yes, sir. I have two questions, uh, both to Ms. Green. Uh, the first one is, um, you mentioned, I didn't see it in that, that RFP that you had up, but is there ever points given for Mississippi offices, uh, if companies have Mississippi offices versus out of state? No, sir. We're not allowed to do that. Okay. And the second is, um, regarding the questions deadline, if you guys release answers to those questions after the questions deadline is due. Does, do we need to ask for an extension of the um, questions deadline? I mean, I've seen projects where you guys, a question gets asked, the answer is really different than the scope of work, and that brings up more questions. So, if that's the case, um, I have been notified that, it, say, we gave an answer and it conflicted then we would have to issue an addendum or an amendment is what we called it on here. We would have to issue an amendment to extend the deadline to allow us time to um, take in any additional, to fix the discrepancy, take in any additional questions. And so 
we would have to extend the deadline, but we would also for the submittal, but also the deadline for any um, inquiries. But if I don't know that, I can't do that. So I would just say that if that's the case, um, when I say I get questioned, most of the time when I get questions, it's not of that nature. It's about the formatting of or the construction of the SOQ. So if there's a conflict, flick, just let me know. So yes. Yes, sir. you to list it's all persons listed on the project team the project team consists of your key personnel so that's the connection so if your key personnel are listed as your project team that's the folks we're wanting you to give us the resumes about does that right okay so in the, in the solicitation it says all so if you're telling us your project team is all of the surveyors that are going to be doing land surveying services outside of clerical work then that's, those are the resumes that we expect you to have on, in your SOQ. Um, mm -hmm. Or if you, and another thing that I've seen a lot is if you provide an organizational chart, and you've got clerical staff, and you've got other staff, you're now identifying them as key personnel because you provide an organi organizational chart of those who will be participating in the contract itself. So 
just be aware. It's, it's, <coughs> we're trying to capture the people that are primarily doing the services that are requested. And um, we are also making alterations to our solicitation and make it reflective of key personnel. Yeah, I think that's been the biggest change that we're looking at now is just making sure that it's clear that we're looking for key personnel and not your org chart. Right. Hey, so I know in Are we, are we, uh, is that a question specific to a solicitation that's current? Or is uh, that no, it's a, it's a past solicitation. Okay. So it's not a current one. But, you know, back, back to the survey, and we just use it as an example. So, you know, key staff may be the surveyors themselves or licensed surveyors. They may have support staff who would be, you know, just the, the general labor guys who are out there helping, you know, tote around the equipment or, you know, hold the uh, survey polls and things like that. So, would those people be considered? Do we classify those as professional services? It's the PEs that are professional services. Right. Yeah. In that, in this example. Right. So surveyors are you know, licensed professional. Right. Too. So oh, okay. you know, surveyors and engineers really aren't much different as far as licensure goes. Okay. We're trying to clarify it. So we've gotten some questions on it, and I would just encourage you that if we issue another RFQ that still appears that it's not clear, then <coughs> let us ask that question um, so that we can clarify it. I know one of the things that it's like the clerical. You know, there's a difference in you have your engineer that is a key personnel, and then you have your clerical support. Well, we, we don't necessarily expect you to provide a resume for them, but if you list them on the project team as you know key personnel, and that's why we're trying to define that key personnel, it's because there, there is some ambiguity in that, and so we're trying to nail that down. So if we, if we provide an organizational chart, then we should only provide an organizational chart with key personnel? Or that's your project team. So an organizational chart with your entire staff is different than the project team organizational chart. Again, going back but to the... Yes, key you, personnel. Yeah, if you say, for instance, you provide an organizational chart, but on the next page you say, and our RFQ says key personnel for project resumes. And if you've got an org chart that just shows the, the organization and the structure, and then you've, you've clearly identified section C or whatever key personnel resumes, and you've identified the key personnel, I think that's a, a difference, and that shows us you've, you've met the requirement because you provided the key personnel resume and then you've identified them as the project team. But again, we have to make that clarification in the solicitation for you to be able to do that. But I don't think we, with that change, we wouldn't, we wouldn't discount the fact that you've provided an org chart and the key personnel because that, you've clearly delineated the difference to us. And sometimes when we're going, and I'll just admit it, that when we go through these evaluations, I mean, when we, go, when we evaluate the uh, responses that we receive, we do, if, if something's missing, we do go back to the RFQ to see if, you know, was it clear? If it wasn't clear, what can we do next time to clear that up? So, um, although people may make mistakes or miss something or, or read it differently than what was, um, how it was worded or whatever, it lets us know that we need to tighten the language up to, to, to be very clear about what um, what we're looking for on that. So we learn lessons on these things too. <laughs> Anyone? Yes, sir. You stated that uh, in your procurement requirements, <coughs> you stated that minority slash WBE are only encouraged, right? Then what is the essence of the form that's got to be submitted with your proposals? What was the Okay. Last part. He said that uh, when you did your presentations, you we talked that. about the minority businesses and the small businesses, and you said that they were not required. Mm -hmm. So what's the purpose of the form? Oh, well, the forms, to okay. the so we require, we encourage participation, and by by us requesting that list, then we, I, I may have to pull it up to see how it's worded, but we require the list. 
And so if you complete the list, then you have gone through the exercise of preparing a list for that solicitation for those services. But the purpose is to show us that you did, that our goal, our, our policy is to promote it. We can't require it. And so the list is to show us that you as a contractor have at least made those phone calls and, and reached out to other organizations to see if they could support that um, or be a part of that project team. But there's no penalty if I don't put it in there. No penalty, no sir. Okay. State law doesn't require that. So allow that, I'm sorry. It doesn't allow for us to do that. Right. Yes. I think you have to show the effort. Hmm. It's the effort. The list is the effort. The list is the effort to show that you went out and contacted the Yes. Mr. Wyatt. I think if you look at the uh, RQ, there is a category and the score for the quality of the submittal. And so if you look at the one of the requirements are to submit this meeting, we be form. So you know how you did on that form to affect your score on the quality. But like she said that question was asked is your is your um, form or your your ability or your efforts to get this project thrown out if you don't fill out that table that's yes or no I think that was the, one of the questions I mean it still counts even if you don't fill out the table right so if you look uh, So we require our offers to um, include Mimby Weebies on a solicitation list. That form is the list. Okay. Yes, sir. I see the next section is our network. And uh, I'm a small firm, small market firm. And Okay. All right. Uh, if there are no further questions, then we'll we'll go ahead and tackle that. One. Yes, sir. There are federal dollars. I know them So there is a maybe weavy requirement, but it's the six affirmative steps. There's not a set aside. Most of the time I get the question, is there a set aside? Which means can we devote certain like let's just say five percent, can we devote five percent of a project to maybe weavies? That doesn't exist with these dollars. What we're allowed to do under state law is require you to solicit maybe we State law does not allow us to require, nor does federal law require a minimum participation by the We encourage programs do include goals. For instance, the SRF loan program, if anyone's ever worked with that, 
Each year, EPA sets goals for participation. And if a contractor, if it only applies to the contractor for SRF, if the contractor meets that goal, he doesn't have to prove that he solicited MBEs. The fact that he has the goals <coughs> met shows that he solicited. But there are no goals in these programs. Therefore, you have to demonstrate how you solicited the maybe weebies. Um, if you do not subcontract at all, if you do not intend to subcontract, then technically you have no solicitation list. It's not just that you didn't solicit maybe me weebies, you didn't solicit anybody. And so you would need to document that on your form, that we're not subcontracting, we didn't ever consider subcontracting, and therefore we didn't solicit anyone. Um, the, the main reason that we want to do this is to make sure that all folks in Mississippi and in this area get a fair shot at working on these projects. We want this to be a collaborative effort for everyone on the coast to participate in. And that's why we are having this workshop today, so that some of you folks who are with the bigger firms can meet some of these folks that are with the smaller firms. Um, you may not even realize the expertise that are available to you from these smaller firms. And so we're going to have a networking break in just a few minutes. and. I would encourage you not just to talk to the folks that are sitting at the tables, talk to each other. Find out what, what the, your fellow workshop attendees do and what they could offer you and what you could offer them. I mean, that kind of leads into what you were saying. Um, how do we know who's here? Um, one of the things that we put on the table is a, a spreadsheet of everybody who registered. In that spreadsheet, you have the name of the um, industry or the company, as well as a list of some of the different activities that they conduct. That's one way of knowing who's in the room. Um, we are, let's, let's go ahead and, I, I kind of want to do something a little bit different from what's on the agenda. I don't know how open you all are to, are to this idea, but I'm going to put it out there. Um, how about, if, if you are willing, you, you stand up, give us your name, the name of the company, whether or not you are a small business, a minority business, a, a women-owned woman -owned business, and, and we'll just go from there. How about that? Okay, if you want to. I can't make it mandatory. All right, so volunteer. Since, since you brought it up, sir, we're going to start with you. How about that? <laughs> Okay, what are some of the services you provide? Uh, project management, QAQC, uh, inspection, thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. Anybody else want to volunteer and just kind of let people know who, who's in the room? Yes, sir. Uh, I will stay up because I am uh, Jim Kelly with Three Point Ecological, and I am the president of the Southeast Chapter of the Society for Ecological Restoration. And we're currently uh, putting together a, a symposium in Ocean Springs in October. My specialty is, is, uh, is ecological restoration. And uh, I've been doing ecological restoration for 25 years. And uh, I would encourage anyone here that is interested in, in ecological restoration to please check us out on the website. I've got some information here uh, on ecological restoration and the conference that's going to be held in October. So, okay. I'm a, I'm a restoration ecologist in 25 years with my people. All right, thank you. Anybody else want to just let kind of let us know who you are? Yes, sir. I'm uh, Larry Jones with Reef Innovations. I actually have a contractor. Our main area is being a subcontractor to the primes for providing product. Uh, our main product is the reef ball, eco wraps, things like that, for moisture restoration, shoreline protection, erosion control, as well as biological reefs, offshore and stuff in, in the name. Uh, we've been in business for 25 years, and we're located in Florida, but we travel all over the world, and I've done a lot of work throughout Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and of course Florida, as well as the East Coast. So anybody that's interested in doing any restoration work or anything like that, where you're looking for some products and stuff other than river and rubble, that's one of the things that we do. So we'll be happy to look out for that. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. I'm Joel Chaki with Ben Coast. We uh, do a lot of data collection for the state. We're out of Baton Rouge. So we've worked on several restoration projects with the state of Louisiana. We do ADCP work, discharge work, uh, water levels, and salinity. So everybody needs that type of service. So I can pass our cards. All 
All right. All right. So we getting started on our networking. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Chris Haney. I'm president and founder of Terramar Applied Sciences at LLC. I live in a place I won't name right now because I don't want to claim that the chief has to play. Um, we have had a couple projects, three actually, here in the Gulf. One, we worked with uh, a law firm in New Orleans to provide science and research data and expertise for uh, a claim on, on the uh, impact of the oil spill for the commercial maintenance industry. Uh, right now, we're running an observer program on behalf of the Department of Interior, mostly out of Pasadena, Mississippi, to put observers on a program called Go Maps. And finally, uh, in 2010 and 11, I ran one of the Department of Interior's nerd projects in Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, yes, ma'am. Anybody? Yes. Can I add something just okay. real quick? We do mostly science and technical peer review and project evaluation. So we help clients evaluate <coughs> projects that they're funding. Are they getting the job done? Okay. All right. Yes, sir. My name is Gerald Danetta. I'm the president and owner of the Net Door Service out of Venice, Louisiana. I'm in several boards, <coughs> business, and grass runs. Like you need to, and we do everything that we work on. And uh, we have fast transportation, boats and barges, shower okay. All right, all right. Anybody else? If if not, I have something I need to say. Oh, okay. I'm with Ecological Associates. Uh, we're based in Florida, but we're actually working out on Cat Island right now. We do mostly uh, field work for biological sciences. We have 50 scientists working all over the southeast. Um, our expertise is in sea turtles mostly, and I just want to let you guys know we're finding sea turtle nests out on Cat Island, so we're around. Check them out. All right. If they can identify their first name so we can find them on the list, that would be Okay. Okay. Um, did you catch it? Did you catch his name? Great. Great. All right. Mark. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Marika McKenzie. I'm on the uh, third page of the. <laughs> uh, I'm president of Cornerstone Engineering in Clinton, Mississippi. And I'm, a, I'm a new business owner. I've been in business six months. But I've uh, been practicing civil engineering for 18 years with different companies. And I'm here just to try to connect people. Uh, kind of, I'm really a shy person, but people come out there and get me folks. Move on to other business. But uh, I do geotech. Uh, civil engineering, a little bit of structural. Uh, mainly a water resource engineer is what I am, but I've done a lot of different things. Got a degree from Mississippi State in civil engineering, a master's degree in LSU, and I've done some studies in uh, Colorado State University. So if I need any of those type of studies, consider my firm. So if I had my bill, I'd ring it. <laughs> I would ring it. All right. I think Mark has done. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm Mark Wise with Anchor QEA Engineers. We focus on coastal engineering. We've got some living shoreline projects, we've got some 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 shoreline projects, we I'm the program manager for the natural water resources sector. I've been with them for 10 years. Before that, I was with the Department of Natural Resources in Louisiana, where I helped uh, spur off the benefits use of dredge material program and the LCA program with the Corps of New Orleans. And right. we, do, we do mostly NEPA compliance permitting and remediation. Okay, thank you. All right, so what we're going to do is take this networking out there. We got some water, it's cold water. Oh, I'm sorry, Melanie wanted to make another statement, but when she finished, you all just feel free to go outside, go out there now, um, for your area. Yeah, one last thing, and then I'm not going to come back up here after the networking break unless y'all ask me to. But um, I was 
t I told you earlier how you can find out about projects, but I would encourage you that if if we send out an email or you know an advertisement that says that describes the activities that we're looking for, you may not be able to come in as the prime, but there are services related to that project that you can um, that you can provide. I would encourage you to follow that solicitation. I would encourage you to come to the pre-submittal meetings that we have. That will give you an opportunity to network with um, prime contractors that are the, that are present at the meeting that you that you know are interested in that work. And then also, um, we typically add the the sign-in sheet from those pre-submittal meetings to the response to inquiries, and that would also be another opportunity for you to get contact information of, uh, from individuals that are interested in doing that work. So I just wanted to throw that out there for you. Okay, so we got, like I said, some refreshments outside. Please go ahead and um, grab you something and, and communicate, network, and we'll continue. The certificate requirements. So we're gonna start with Jeremy Semper, oh, Carlos. So we're going to start with Carlos Galloway, and he's with the Mississippi Department of Finance and Administration, and he's going to talk to you about your magic registration. I cannot say that word. But, and after that, we're going to have Jeremy Sanford with the Small Business Administration, and after that, Derek Finley, and he's also with the Small with the Minority and Small Business Development Division of Mississippi Development Authority. So, Carlos is going to be up. Carlos Galloway. I am um, a staff officer within the Department of Finance and Administration. Um, I So um, I am a staff officer within the Mississippi Department of Finance and Administration, Office of Person, Travel, and Fleet Management. And um, where our mission is, is we administer and we manage statewide contracts for commodities. Um, and that's about 450 statewide contracts that we administer and manage on a yearly basis. And we also um, are responsible for maintaining um, a cost-effective fleet management program. Um, for the state of Mississippi and so we, we're kind of the main hub for procurement you know so we are managed by um, PPRB which is the highest level of procurement that's the uh, public procurement review board um, which everything kind of trickles down you know she, she mentioned PSCRB which is a division um, of MSPB currently but it will move under DFA um, starting in about six six months or so January the 1st um, so everything I'm going to talk about is going to be procurement related and I'm going to speak on magic, the registration part, but I'm also going to dive into the bid board where not only the contract, oppor not only the contract opportunity, okay, so not only the um, procurement opportunity for the restoration projects, but all procurement opportunities within the state of Mississippi, I'm going to show you exactly where they're housed. Um, they're not hidden, um, just so that you know, okay? So, these are the topics of discussion right here. We already had a brief introduction. We're going to go through the benefits of registering with MAGIC. Then we're going to have an overview of registration through bid submission. New vendor registration demo. We're going to go through pay mode. Um, how to maintain company data, add product categories and bidders, and then we're going to go to the website where we can view all the business opportunities for the state of Mississippi. Okay, benefits of registering with MAGIC. First, you can maintain your account information. You can upload a W-9 or add bidders. Ma uploading a W-9, uh, it keeps you from having to fax your W-9 or mail it in by snail mail, so it's there right in the system um, when you initially register it and it can be uploaded and it can be visible by the Department of Finance and Administration and that just kind of 
um, skips a step in the process and it kind of speeds the process up a little better. Um, adding bidders, we know you have one company but you can't have multiple bidders for your company. So you can have an individual that is the account administrator but then you can add bidders, say someone in your strategic sourcing department responsible for submitting the proposals. They can also have their own user ID where they can just um, have access to submit those um, proposals if um, they are electronic. Now most proposals in the state of Mississippi for, um, for services are not electronic. Um, we're going towards electronic. Uh, I think January 1, uh, we will be requiring electronic proposals to be submitted. So um, I just want to I'm going to show you where these training resources are as well so you can beef your knowledge up on how to respond electronically to these proposals. This is going to be a change in the procurement world and we know in the state of Mississippi we, um, some, some organizations do lack that, um, um, that technical aspect but moving forward you're going to have to learn it. Um, there's no way around it. We're going to have to move forward with technology and electronic proposals. Okay. All right, you can also receive email notifications of business opportunities. The email notifications are based on the product categories that you register for. Okay, so once we go through this registration process, well, you'll see where the product categories are, and depending on that product category that you choose determines whether you get an email notification or not. And like I said earlier, it gives you the, also the ability to electronically respond to proposals. Okay, so this is kind of the process. Um, first step, you will register as a supplier. All right. Step two, you will receive the ID and password. Three, you could then maintain your account information. Four, view business opportunities. Then five, submit the actual bid response. But Step four, viewing the business opportunities. You do not have to be registered in Magic to view the statewide bid opportunities, okay? It's web-based, it's open to the public. Every bid over $50,000, whether it be for a service or for a commodity, must be posted on the statewide procurement portal, okay? So not only this bid, but all other bid opportunities are also posted there. So once you register, um, sorry. So if you are already registered, okay. So you, if you've done business with the state of Mississippi in the last, say, last six or seven years, okay, then you were a converted vendor or you are a newly registered vendor. Okay, if you're having trouble um, obtaining your vendor ID and password to log into Magic, this is what you can do. Um, you enter your vendor ID request um, and you can say, hey, this is my magic vendor number, vendor name, contact name, contact email address, and contact phone number. You provide that information to the help desk there at mash at dfa.ms.gov and they'll call you back and they'll provide you with your user ID and your password in, a in order to log in into the system. Okay, now we're just gonna go through like a new registration demo. High level registration process. Um, so you can kind of see what it looks like and kind of get a feel for it once you're in. Who's already registered in here? In Magic already? Okay, yeah, we, so we definitely gotta get you guys registered because if you wanna get paid, <laughs> then you have to register in Magic, okay? So if you're doing business with any state agency and you wanna receive a payment, you have to register in Magic. It's a must. You won't get paid any other way. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So if, if you are on a project and say you're the prime, right, and you are directly doing business with 
say Department of Environmental Quality, okay? Now you're the prime. Di environmental and quality, they're gonna pay you, okay? So if you have any sub, or so you're saying subcontractors? So you have subcontractors under that prime, Environmental quality is not responsible for paying the subcontractors. That prime would then pay the sub. However, if you're a subcontractor <coughs> and you're doing business with a prime, even though environmental quality is not paying you, you still want to register with Magic because you can see the future opportunities that are out there as well. It's more than just you know this opportunity. It's more opportunities out there. I mean, they're out there every single day. They're putting them out there. Yes, so, so like cities, counties, municipalities, all of them are required to submit their um, bids that are going to be posted publicly over the MTAP. And that's the Mississippi Procurement of Technical Assistance Program. And they, in turn, go into MAGIC and create a bid, and then that bid is then published to the procurement portal where all the bid opportunities are. That's going to be for any project, usually over $50,000. But sometimes they post bids for less than $50,000. But it's usually for um, bid opportunities over fifty dollars because that's state law. Anything over fifty dollars has to be posted to the procurement board. Is that effective January 1st? Is that going to be everything? No, ma'am. That's, that's all. Al it's already everything right now. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so no more. Go here. There's this link. Okay, this link right here, it takes us to this vendor landing page, okay? And everything that I just described in those earlier email, I mean earlier um, PowerPoint slides, they're here on this page. And I also provided you with that handout, that very first link you see on there in that first paragraph is to this page here. I just okay. So it didn't. I thought it was gonna pop. I had trouble with the earlier thing. Okay. I don't think it's gonna pop up there. <coughs> Here we go. Okay. So this is what the supply registration page looks like, okay? You can see there's basic information about your company there that you need to fill out. All right. Pretty much, this stuff is self-explanatory. But if you look on the handout that I gave you, it gives you high level of what's gonna be required on registration. The first thing is the system won't allow duplicate FEIN or social security numbers. Okay, so if you have already registered in the system with an FEIN or a social security number, it won't let you re-register with the same one. All right? That's, that's, some of the, that's just like one of the highlights. But, uh, of course, you have your email address that's required, company name, phone number. Oh, it's moving kind of fast, too fast. Okay. Send medium, that's how you want to get your registration. It's usually email there. You got to put your street address. So I have a question. Um, and if you already put your name and your information in, but you have multiple companies. Okay, if you have multiple companies, you have to have different tax IDs. Okay, that's what okay. Yes, you, so it could be the same company name, but tax ID has to be unique in every case. And it's also dealing with your, your W-9, right, and your vendor registration, the tax IDs, they have to match, okay? If they don't, you won't get paid, okay? So, uh, this is just some additional company info, vendor headquarter, permanent staff in Mississippi, vendor type. Um, we'll go through the required fields here, send medium. Um, you usually want to put email on there. Company address, you know, you got your street, country, state. It's just basic information. Then you got a contact person there. That's usually like the company um, or the contract administrator there. 
that's going to be responsible for any contacts uh, with the vendor registration. Product categories. Okay, this is the this is the biggest deal on here. Okay, just let you know. Product categories. What you want to do is when you come in here and register, it's going to ask you for a category ID. All right. I'm just choosing 91,000 because I know this is construction related. Okay. Look on that handout. It tells you if you we use NIGP codes here in the state of Mississippi. There are 8,500 NIGP codes. So whatever type of service or whatever type of commodity you provide, it's a code for. Okay. But do not be specific when registering for these product categories. The reason is because if you see here, 91001 is uh, it's kind of like service, building construction, acoust uh, acoustical service building, back music, service building, cleaning. Okay. When the agency places out a solicitation, they may place it out, say, somewhere for one of these categories that's related to here. So, they may not choose 91001, which is what your company is registered for. Okay? They may choose 91004, which is just in the neighborhood of whatever service that they are needing. However, to get around that and not limit yourself, you always register for the product category ending in 00. Okay? So if you know you have some type of um, building maintenance service, Register for that high-level class every single time. This also gives you an opportunity to tell other vendors, say, in the same arena of work, kind of what you do. If you can't provide that service or commodity, maybe you know somebody who can. And you let them know that, hey, it's a big opportunity out here. I'm not saying that, you know, you're going to, um, I mean, you, I'm not saying that you're, not being competitive by telling someone else. If, I'm just saying, if you can't provide it, maybe you can tell somebody else. Okay? <coughs> but don't limit yourself because an agency always does not place the product category on the RFX that is specific. Okay? They always don't go specific. So, how that will play. Okay, then you got the self-certified minority indicators. You can self-certify as a minority there. Um, and then once you pretty much fill all this information out, you're pretty much going to be rich. Okay. But that's just high level, the gist of the registration process. So once you are registered, okay, you're going to get an email notification based on the email address you provided in your registration. It's going to come from IDM system, so don't think it's spam mail if you see IDM. It's going to provide you with your user ID. That's the first thing it's going to give you. It's going to give you your magic user ID. Okay. Then your next email is going to give you a temporary password. If you see that temporary password here, you see how it looks funny, right? I mean, best because um, that it's, it's coded in a way that you cannot type that password in once you go in and log in initially. Do not type that password in. You have to copy it and paste it in. Okay? You don't see how encrypted it is by looking at it at hindsight, but it is encrypted. Okay? Pay mode. You know, the state works with Bank of America, and this is how that you um, receive your payment electronically, okay? So your magic vendor number and your pay mode account are all tied to one another. So you have to have a magic vendor number before you go in there and register for pay mode in order to get paid, all right? This is just so you get a, an electronic um, funds transfer. Pay mode's website there, 
everything that is done in pay mode, um, you know, it's through them. So if you have any problems with pay mode, you have their number there, um, and they'll assist you. All right, so then you would log in. Once you have that information, you can update some account information, um, company address, email, phone number, and email. Always make sure that your email is always update, updated. If somebody leaves your company, right, you make sure that you have an alternate email on there because these vendor um, email accounts are tied to the product categories that you register for and also they're tied to the automatic email notifications that are sent out for the product categories you register for. Okay, Always make sure the email address is updated. Product categories, we just talked about this, always register at that class level in in zero, zero. You don't want to limit yourself. That's the bidders. So you, once you register, you can update um, your account info by adding bidders. Um, if the main contact person is different from the person submitting the proposals. Um, and then view business opportunities. Now, this website here is where all the state of Mississippi bid opportunities are posted. All of them. Okay? I'm not sugarcoating this guy. That's why I'm going to go here in real time. All right? Because I always hear people say, oh, the bid opportunities are hidden. I don't know where they are. Where are they? Well, this is where they are, guys. Okay. And I want you to look on that paper on the back at the very bottom. Okay. The website is there. Okay. It tells you exactly how to get here to these bid opportunities. You can go to, this is just one way of doing it. Go to DFA's page here. Click on, are you interested in doing business with Mississippi? And then you see how these boxes here are going horizontally across the screen. You want to make sure that your screen looks exactly like this. If it does not, you will not be able to search for any bid opportunities because your compatibility settings are off. Okay? Make sure that your screen looks like this, and if it doesn't, this is, um, this is not regular internet. You may want to call the help desk when you're having an issue, okay? So if your screen is not lined up, please call the help desk. Because you won't be able to search and you're going to think the system is a bomb. All right. So procurement opportunities right here. And I'm just going to go in here and just type in construction, okay? All right. We see bid opportunities already there. You know, we were just talking about cities, counties, municipalities here. We got Cannon Municipality, um, Adams County, Choctaw County. So not only are state agency bid opportunities out here, but all public entities within the state of Mississippi. All those bids are published here. And it's for any commodity or any service that you can provide. You see here it has the agency. Anytime you see MTAP here, that's the Mississippi Procurement Technical Assistance Program, okay? And they can got, those guys can give you insight on these bids. Okay, if it's something that's missing, you don't see, like, in these attachments here, it usually has everything that you need for submission. But if you see anything lacking on here, then you call um, MTAP if you see the agency name. So, you see in that attachment, it tells you when that bid is due, where you need to send it to, um, if you have any questions, it tells you, should give you all the details that you need here in these attachments. And every bid has one. All right. Also, it gives you the RFX number. So this is going to be very important when you start submitting these responses electronically. But for these cities, and counties, municipalities, you won't have to worry about submitting electronic proposals. It's only going to be for state agencies. Okay. So it, it's going to tell you in the attachment where to submit it to. It's going to give you a description of it, status if it's open, advertised date, submission date, and then opening date. Okay. So that's all the information that you'll need there. Uh, let me see. You guys got any questions? I think I'm almost towards the end of here. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then if you click on this RFX number here, it just gives you adi additional information. Uh, 
But definitely make sure that when you see these proposals out here, you look to these attachments for all your details. Okay, it should tell you everything. If you're having problems searching on this website, if your compatibility settings are off, anything that you need help with in this process, you need to know who to contact. If you see MTAP next to that bid, you want to call MTAP. If you, see, if you see a state agency's name next to that bid, it's always going to have a contact person on there. It's always going to have a contact. And I want you to make sure that show you where that contact person is, okay? Yeah, this is the statewide procurement portal. So it hadn't changed, I don't think. It may look different based on your browser. But in a nutshell, this is how it's going to look. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Every single bid is on this website. If 50000 or more, but it doesn't have to be 50000 in order for an agency to publish a bid. That's just the state law that it, anything over 50000 has to be published. But they also do them for under 50 all the time. So this, they, this is hand, it goes hand in hand with this. But I'll let Mr. Fitt. Yes, sir. Are these just for bid type opportunities or, or will they have qualification type like for professional services? Yes, sir. So for any service or commodity, any service or commodity will be posted to this site by state law. It has to be posted here. In addition to being advertised in the Clarion Ledger. Or not saying Clarion Ledger, whatever local newspaper that that um, municipality uses. So that's pretty much it. That's the registration. Um, after this session, we'll be outside. If you haven't registered in Magic, we have internet access. We can go ahead and get you registered today if you want to get registered. Okay? But well, that, that's it. Questions? Any questions? More questions? I got business cards. You guys have any trouble with uh, agency or any bids? I'm your guy. I can get you, point you to the right person if. I don't know the answer myself. I'll make sure it gets to the right person. Yes, sir. Uh, can we emphasize or uh, emphasize, excuse me, yes, sir. Uh, the social education? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, here, at, on your self-certified minority indicators, it asks you, hey, are you a minority vendor? I say yes, okay? Then it's gonna make me select all the applicable minority indicators. So self-certified minority, you have a minority code over here. It tells you, Asian, Asian specific, <laughs> whatever your minority code is, it's gonna be here. Also, you can select if you're women-owned, veteran-owned, or small business. And what this will do, and this will relay over to your magic profile. So when an agency 
say, hey, if they awarded you a bid, they can then go and see on your profile, you know, if you're a minority vendor. However, that information still has to be placed in your proposal. Okay. And also, guys, I don't know if you know this, but you know you can walk in the MTAP anytime you get ready. They, these guys have satellites all over um, the state that you can walk in if you need help submitting proposals. You want to find out where opportunities are. You know, those are the guys you want to talk to. So just a bit opportunities. I think you are pretty much done. Yeah, yeah. So questions and answers here. Bid submission. If you have a problem with a bid, you usually want to contact the agency. Okay? The person in that attachment, that's who you want to contact most of the time. Okay? Payment info, you want to call the agency. Okay? Because we get a lot of calls about, hey, I haven't been paid, I haven't been paid. You want to call the agency. We are the Department of Finance and Administration, and we do process the payment, but only after the agency has entered the invoice document. Okay. Um, so state statewide contract vendors, if you want to get on state contract or you want to know how to get on state contract, you call that number right there. We have you know, 450 state contracts. 150 of them are for furniture. However, um, if you want to get on a state contract, it's it's pretty easy, okay? As long as you can provide that commodity or service, you can go out there and bid. We have negotiated, we have competitive, you can get on it. And that's the number to the call center. And that's the call center's email. And those are the most important things that you want to take away from here today, okay? So if you ever need any help, you call that help desk, okay? But I'm going to give you my card as last resort. That's pretty much it. Okay. When you're doing presentations in the afternoon, you have to be somewhat brief. So if y'all would just give me about five minutes, we're just going to talk about what the SBA has to offer. A lot of times, uh, one of the things that I'm learning is a lot of people don't know what the SBA is. But we are a large government agency uh, that's actually set up to help entrepreneurs such as yourself to take your business to the next level. And I don't know about you, but in life, in business, whatever you're doing, we're always, as people, trying to find the edge. Trying to find the edge on how we can beat out competition and take our business to the next level. All right, so that's what we're going to be talking about today, um, a little bit about what the SBA has to offer. Um, so first and foremost, the government is the largest buyer of goods and services. All right. Um, the government spends over $500 billion per year uh, in goods and services. They will spend things, uh, spend uh, money on things like IT services, uh, research and development. Uh, you can be a seamstress. The government needs seamstresses. Anything pertaining to business, the government needs it. All right. And so what they do is to find that business, they put out contracts to find that particular business. So whether it's uh, uh, whether it's uh, construction, whatever it is, we're basically trying to find people in these various areas uh, to help us 
uh, to accomplish what we're trying to do. So um, to find that edge, you need what's called certifications. And we've been talking about this all day, but I wanna talk about some of the certifications that the SBA encourages you to get. And the reason being is because when the government is spending over $500 billion in, uh, in revenue on various goods and services, you wanna be able to get a part of the pie, right? And in order to get a piece of the pie, you've got to get these certifications. So the first certification that we're gonna talk about and it's kind of small, but I can send you all this. Um, it's called the Small Business Certification, right? Then the government has to set aside 23% of that $500 billion to small businesses and people that have this certification, all right? I don't know about you, but if I was a business owner, I would want to know how to get in that bracket, all right? So in order to become, uh, to get in that, in that particular uh, portion you have to get the small business certification and it's very easy to get it's a self certification that you can get through a website called sam.gov if you're a small business owner in here and you haven't gotten that certification I encourage you to get it because there's going to be opportunities that are set aside for people that specifically have this certification all right so there's all different types of certifications that we encourage you to get. Another one is the women-owned business certification. It's all about setting your business apart from others. When you have a certification and another business doesn't ha have that, guess what? You are ahead of the game. You, um, you are, you're cutting edge and you're able to, to do what you need to do. The next one is the, the women's own business certification. It has a 5% goal. Um, so 5% of all those revenues that the government does is set aside for women owned businesses. Again, this uh, certification is a self certification and you can do it on your own simply by going to the website sam.gov. Another very important uh, certification. Do we have any veterans in here? Anybody a veteran? We have two veterans. So this is a good certification for you to have, a veteran-owned business certification. There's a 3% uh, set aside for veteran-owned businesses. Um, basically, you just have to have your business 51% owned by a veteran. If you have that particular criteria, you are most likely eligible for this particular certification. Then you have a hub zone certification. A hub zone is basically when your business is in an area that is considered underutilized. Um, does anybody know if they're in a hub zone, their business is in a hub zone? Because you could be missing out on really great contracts and opportunities if you don't know that. So the way that you find out whether or not you're a hub zone is you go to the hub zone website, uh, which is basically found at um, sba.gov backslash hub zone. You go there and put your business address in, in that particular map, and it will show you whether or not you're a hub zone. Why do I want to know if I'm a hub zone? Because every certification that I have sets me apart. And if I fall within a hub zone, 3% of all those government contracts are going to hub zone businesses. All right. So you need to know um, the only criteria for uh, finding out if you're a hub zone is you have to have your business in a hub zone area and 30% of your employees have to reside within a hub zone. All right. If you fall within that criteria, you're setting yourself up for some, some grand opportunities. Um, we also have the Small Disadvantaged Business Certification, which has a 5% goal, also found at sam.gov. You can self-certify. And one of the most important uh, programs that we have at the SBA is the 8A Business Development Program. This is a nine-year program for people that have been in business for at least two years. And what it does is, is we help you to develop your business. There's all type of free workshops that we present to you. You have your own business development specialist that you can go and talk to personally. And a lot of businesses um, that have gotten in this particular program, almost 90% get government contracts. So if you haven't gotten a government contract, you ought to consider the 8A program. Uh, why? Because um, there is so many businesses that thousands of businesses across the nation that have gotten into this program, that have gotten government contracts that took their business on over the threshold of million dollar businesses. And so if you wanna take your business to the next level, I encourage you to consider, not only is um, there an opportunity for government contracts, but you get connected uh, to multi-billion dollar companies by getting into this program. There's a lot of great opportunities by getting 
in, into this program, and I encourage you all to, uh, to take a look at it at least. And so that kind of sums up um, our, uh, what we have to offer. Of course, SBA has a lot of different things. Primarily, we're talking about government contracting, but we also help people with finances. We have loans up to $5 million. Um, basically, any, anything that you may need help with as it pertains to your business, you can just give us a, a call. We're kind of like the one-stop shop. If we don't know the answer, we know who to get you in touch with. And so our job is to help you to take your business to the next level and to make your dream come true. Any, any questions? All right. We're going to give it over to the next presenter. <laughs> All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. I know uh, being the last speaker on the agenda, it's uh, definitely in my favor to be a little brief with you. Uh, I do have a presentation I guess I should pull up. And the uh, good thing is a lot of, we have had a discussion with some of the other presenters where some of the information has been presented. So just the plan for today is kind of reinforce that and then share with you a little more details about our certification. Uh, first, uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Mississippi Department of Environment and Quality for inviting us here today, and thank you to you for having us as your guest to talk. Uh, on behalf of our Executive Director, Glenn McCullough, Jr., uh, it's always a privilege to come in front of small businesses and, and share some of the programs and resources that are available to you. Now, I may need some assistance. That's my tech savvy. Am I loaded yet? Or? Do you have, is that your presentation? Uh, it should be on a PowerPoint. Yes. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Or a thumb drive? Uh, no, My apologies. Te te technical Mississippi Development Authority. You know, oftentimes you probably, you know, hear about MDA involved in bringing companies to the state. Uh, you know, we've had some signature business announcements. Uh, over the last several years in terms of bringing companies from Japan and Germany and having them set up locations and business operations here in the state of Mississippi. Employing Mississippians is the goal. Uh, we also have a division called our existing business and industry division that helps large existing businesses here in the state grow and thrive. Well, the office that I work for is our Minority and Small Business Development Division, and it simply states the focus of our area. Our focus is on all small businesses, as well we have programs for minority and women-owned companies. And these programs are all legislated through the state of Mississippi, and uh, they're available for you know, businesses that are based here in the state. And uh, again, uh, some, some of them also have some uh, net worth thresholds, as well as the residence, residency requirement as well. Just to breeze over this, but this states our mission. Uh, it kind of reinforces what I just discussed in terms of trying to be the, the state's uh, advocate for, uh, for Mississippi small businesses here in the state. Core functions, as I stated, advocacy, uh, access to business opportunities and financial resources, capacity building and training and networking. Now this, this is something that we've talked a little bit about already is the uh, uh, Mississippi Procurement Technical Assistance Program. And what this is, uh, I kind of stated it, it is a federal program through the Department of Defense. And typically every state will have a technical assistance, uh, uh, excuse me, a procurement technical assistance program. And what we've done is we've set up regional offices. So as you see on the lower part of the state there, uh, we have an office uh, here in the uh, Gulfport Biloxi area on Pops Ferry, and uh, that is hosted, and uh, the executive director of that office is uh, Marsha McDowell. The goal of that office and all of the regional offices is every day to meet with small businesses and help them and assist them with their enrollment in MAGIC, as Carlos had talked about, as well as the federal system, SAM, which is the system of, system of awards management. So if you plan, as a small business owner, if you plan to do any business with the state of Mississippi, you have to be enrolled in MAGIC. If you plan to do business with the federal government, you have to be in SAS. So these systems are what you need to be enrolled in, and this program is geared towards assisting you in navigating those systems if you have some difficulty, okay? As well as if you're looking to do some strategizing on how you need to position yourself so that you can contract with these entities, the centers can help as well. Any questions on, on the, the, tech, um, the 
Procurement Technical Assistance Center before we go forward because it, it seems like we've had a real robust discussion about that program and um, it, 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 when you raised your hands and said you know no one's really doing business with the government at this stage I thought well welcome opportunity uh, to definitely engage our regional office here and see how they can assist you in better position yourself yes so earlier registration there was a section that said self-certified and you can mark does that automatically trigger you to be in touch with the MTAP network it does not okay because uh, the MTAP is for all small businesses if you're a veteran owned business small business there is no uh, uh, ethnic or gender requirement to engage with this this is a Department of Defense federal government program basically what it is is they grant us a certain level of money and then the MDA and the state matches that and that money goes to operate these regional offices and give the small businesses here in the state access to the programs and resources available through these offices so again I would encourage you if you're looking at government contracting that this would be again state and federal this could be a great resource for your company Yes. So when you think about technical assistance, you think about somebody pretty much holding your hand through a process. Am I hearing that this will, that's what this program does? Um, it'll hold your hand as if you're searching for different opportunities, if you need to uh, register in different databases, if you need to, I uh, guess, even write your proposal or whatever you're trying to submit, do you offer that level of technical assistance? We look at that, that technical assistance as progressionary. So, uh, you know, one of the key first steps is to get enrolled in those systems. And that's definitely where these entities around the state, again, locally here in uh, Gulfport, Biloxi, we also have the central office, which is based out of MDA's headquarters, and the Woolfolk Building in Jackson, Mississippi, which is right across the street from the state capitol. And then we have a satellite office for the uh, central office in Meridian. Uh, as well as a satellite office in the Delta in South Haven. And then we have an independent office, if you will, but it's still part of the program in the Northeast. And that's based out of Tupelo and Columbus, Mississippi. So, you know, unfortunately we can't be everywhere at, at all times, but we try to make ourselves regionally available. And again, the first steps are, you know, getting enrolled in those systems. Without that, you really don't have access to the opportunities. Okay. Once you once you get enrolled in the systems, then there's other resources that can be available to help you position yourself to become a better contractor. Um, and I'm, I'll skip ahead a little bit. We're actually going to be doing a model contractor program here uh, in, in September in the coastal region. I, I don't know if there's anyone in the audience that has ever participated in that program before. So you've participated in that. That's an a eight to ten week program. We hold about three to four of them a year. And we move them around the state, but usually in September, we always like to have one here in the coast. So kind of stay tuned uh, to announcements of that, and, and maybe we can even make an opportunity where we can announce it through the list, sign up list here. But that is an eight to 10 week program that you can participate in. It's after work, usually from about 5.30 to, to 7.30. And uh, basically what occurs is each week, there's a, a subject that's covered, kind of like a fundamental of doing business with the government. Uh, from business planning, financing, uh, insurance, bonding. These programs are facilitated by professionals in those areas. So it's a real good way if you're, if you're you know, in business and maybe a little uh, new to business to really get your, your inventory of resources available professionals. You don't even have to be a business to attend the model contractor program. You can be a prospective entrepreneur. You may be working for someone else and say, hey, I want to do this on my own. And this can be a real good program to attend and really gain an understanding for what you need to do in order to become an effective contractor to the state or to the federal government. So kind of stay tuned for more information on that. But it's called a model contractor program. And uh, again, we try to hold them around the state so that people have access to them. But it's a, a wonderful program. Yes. Is there a way to sign up to be put on the list of when those come? Yeah, when, when we uh, nail down all the specifics on it, we're still in the planning phase at this point. We distribute it through our databases, and that's probably what I'll try to distribute through the network that we've established here. And then you can sign up online for it and attend. You said model contract? Model contractor development program. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a program we've, uh, it's been going now for probably close to 10 years, and we've probably had over 800 
attendees participated. At the end of the, the eight to 10 weeks, you receive a certificate from the state of Mississippi that states your completion. And uh, that, that, that again may, may be a further certification for, for you and your company. Now that we've talked about the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, certifications, uh, it appears, was the next key uh, subject for us. And what we've been working on for the last year is we've had an analog system of applying for our state minority certification. And we've recently launched it uh, on a website. So this is kind of groundbreaking over the last couple of months. The website has been working fantastic. Uh, and uh, basically what, what our certification is about is if you're an organization and uh, you have an owner that, is fit, that owns 51% of the company and they happen to be an ethnic minority or a woman, they can actually, your company can apply for our minority certification, okay? Once you apply for that certification, you have to also be located here in the state and your, uh, your net worth can exceed 600, your personal net worth can exceed $600,000. You can apply online, and if we have web access, you can probably hit that link and it'll take you to it. Uh, but what that certification does is similar as we, as we were talking through some of the contracts that are available through uh, DEQ, that allows you to uh, to fill the qualifications that they're looking for in their contracting. Now, if you happen to be 60% owned by an ethnic minority or woman, you can also get certified and then you become eligible for working capital loan programs. As we know, a lot of times for small businesses overall, as well as uh, minority women owned companies, the access to capital can be, uh, uh, unfortunately, a, a key barrier to doing business uh, commercially or with any government entity. So there are some legislative, legislative programs that can provide that working capital through a loan-based system uh, that, that can help you fulfill some of these contracting opportunities. So this is the online uh, certification program. If you pan down a little bit, um, basically how it works is if you're looking to apply or if you're curious about if you should apply, you can go there and it will take you to a page that gives you some of the key details about the program. You can click it. So it gives you a, kind of a synopsis of what I, I just mentioned. If you go back to the welcome page, there you go, um, you can then uh, complete the application. But now before you complete the application, you actually have to request access. So if you go to the welcome page uh, and, and pan down, there's an area and all the way to the bottom, uh, request access. You request access, put in your email, and then you'll get a, an email with your temporary password. Because this is a secure site. Uh, you, you have to put in a lot of confidential information, and we wanted to make sure that it, it was the most secure. So you have to have a, a username and password. But once you get that, you can fill out the application, submit it, and then you'll receive an email stating what documents we will need uh, for your business to further complete your review. Once you submit those documents to us, this is all free by the way, once you submit those documents to us, uh, your case manager, who is a dedicated case manager, will review it in detail and issue a certificate from the state that's good for three years. And then your company is certified. If you're interested in accessing some of the working capital programs, we can then uh, uh, connect you with the, 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 uh, the planning development district that will facilitate that loan for us. Okay. So that's kind of the benefit from that standpoint. Again, the goal is minimizing those barriers of uh, accessing capital uh, to fulfill on some of these government contracts or commercial contracts as well. What are typical interest rates? Uh, they're based on the, the prime rate, so um, you know they're a, a markup of that, but very, very, uh, um, how do you say, advantageous rates. Usually there's two programs that we market. There's a minority business enterprise loan program for micro, and that has a maximum lending threshold of about 35000 and that interest rate is usually in the 6% range. And then there's a, a minority business enterprise loan program. That actually has a lending threshold of about 250000 it usually has to be matched with a, a banking facility, 
And then uh, that can be as low as, as about 3.5% at this current stage. Good question. Thank you. So that certification, again, to just kind of give you a synopsis or, or a, a wrap a summary of it, that, that certification allows you access to some of these loan programs, okay? Now, I went on in this page to further look at uh, some of the other programs that are out there. DBE is a, is a certification program through MDOT, which is Mississippi Department of Transportation. If you're interested in contracting with the Department of Transportation, then that's typically the, 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 uh, the, the best, that, that can be a good certification for you because you're in their system. Now the good thing is that MDOT and MDA, we reciprocate those certifications. So if you're certified through MDOT, you can easily get certified through MDA and vice versa. Uh, SPA, Jeremy of course gave us a great breakdown of their programs and the importance of that. Uh, a lot of times the DBE and the MDA certification is a, is a good, uh, progressionary step into the uh, SBA programs as well. And then the other two, uh, the MB Wimbeck, as it's called, is the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. That's more for the commercial side of it. So if you're interested in connecting with the big businesses, the big corporations to contract with, that's the certification that they usually look into for women-owned businesses. Similarly, the NMSDC is the National Minority Supplier Development Council and kind of the same situation with large corporations, but they're looking for more of the ethnic minorities in terms of, of, uh, of membership and certification-wise. We talked about the eligibility for loan programs. There's also a, a bond guarantee program that we promote and provide for, uh, for uh, minority-owned companies as well. So that certification provides you eligibility for that. And basically how that works is we help guarantee the surety agents so that they can write bonds for minority-owned companies. And it's used as that first step. You know, when you need that bond to secure a contract, typically that can be a great program. It minimizes the risk for the surety agent. And then ideally, if you deliver on that project, then your bonding capacity will be in good shape after that going forward. And we talked about the loans, micro-loans, enterprise loan, capital access. now. That is a, a loan program that's available for all small businesses, but it's contingent on having a, uh, a contract with a state entity or a federal contract here, here in the state. So if you have a pending contract, you can actually access capital through the uh, capital access contract loan program, and uh, it's actually 0%. There's some, uh, there's some uh, processing fees for the loan, and they usually range about 1.5%. But for the most part, it's a 0% loan program. Uh, it was formed under our former Governor Barber. He was a, a huge advocate for small businesses contracting with the state of Mississippi. So that program was developed to help, again, minimize uh, uh, the barrier for access to all small businesses to state contract. And so uh, if you ever find yourself in that situation, uh, you can uh, utilize that program accordingly. Go ahead. You have to be a prime contractor on that? Yeah, you have to be uh, directly contracting with either the state, federal government, or municipalities here in the state. And then approximately there's about $3 million in loans per year that goes to Mississippi minority and women-owned companies as a part of these programs. Uh, some further databases, and, and again, we'll kind of just, just move through these pretty quickly. Uh, when you certify your company as a minority or a woman business enterprise here in the state, you also get listed on our certified business database. And that was a part of that link as well, that it was the directory search. So you can utilize that as a prime contractor, you can utilize that to identify minority companies that you can potentially subcontract with. So please feel free to utilize that. That part of the, of the website is open access. So anyone can go to that directory and find companies that, that, uh, that are certified through our office. And then if you certify, your company will be listed there as well. SB Assist and PT Assist, those are internals, but uh, those are, I talked about some of the distribution uh, notices for our programs. That's how we're able to distribute some of the notifications for upcoming programs like the Model Contractor Program. And then we have an independent one, it's called the Minority Business Registry, and uh, that uh, is mnbr.org. And that's more of a self-certification. So if you feel that you 
uh, are a woman-owned business or, or a minority-owned business here in the state, you can go there and input your contact information. And we utilize that registry to promote uh, uh, to our state agencies primarily. So uh, that, that's a way that they can quickly identify uh, minority companies here in the state that they can do business with. Can Certainly can. Mm -hmm. um, and being responsible for reporting, maybe maybe participation and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, over the years, it's, there have been some changes in how to count, uh, I guess, meeting that goal. And one change that I've noticed is that we used to be able to count self-certified, maybe we need participation, mm -hmm. and then now it's certified. So what's the difference in the two, and why would somebody want to be um, certified over just self-certified? Well, self-certified, as we kind of talked a little bit earlier, that is what contributes to the reporting data. So every year we have a, a annual report uh, that comes out that captures the uh, state's minority spend with women-owned companies and minority-owned companies. That is automatically, now, now that we're on magic, that is automatically generated through that self-certification registration that we took a look at uh, during Carlos's presentation. Now, it used to be manual. You used to have the self-certification sheet, and they'd fill it out, send it in to DFA, and then once a purchase order was issued to that company, they would then be flagged in the system. Now, with Magic, it's automatic. As soon as you register, you're flagged in the system as a, as a minority woman-owned business, according to how you market yourself. And then automatically, any funds or any expenditure that is spent with your company goes into a minority expenditure in that annual report. So that, that, that's how that reporting goes. Being certified through our office is not related to that reporting. Uh, I hope that kind of clar clarifies it from that standpoint. But is there any benefit to being certified well, yeah, uh, you know, according to the policy that DEQ has, you're looking for companies that are certified through MDA in terms of being a certified company that um, your internal reporting that you can capture uh, in terms of subcontracting. Um, we do count self-certified, too. We may, that's right. We may have scrolled through that a little mm -hmm. quicker than we needed to, yeah. but, but we do count that as well. Yeah. Um, that's right. Uh, I think it was EPI that they did the Right, and that's that's we not. Have the self certified, mm -hmm. but we couldn't count them because we, you know, because right. they weren't certified. That's right. Yeah, our certified companies can be counted in that capacity, as well as if you're certified, then you gain access to the uh, vendor directory that's on our site, as well as you then become eligible for the uh, financing programs as well. So, so those are the key benefits. That would, would What's that? It, it would be the the last. That's correct. That's correct. Directly uh, benefit is, is in terms of getting access to those programs. Good question. Thank you. Well, yeah, that would be my question is uh, related to that. If you're self-certified and you're counting self-certified Meebies and Weebies on, on the MDEQ solicitations, I mean, anybody could go online and say that they're a minority business, basically, and you would accept that as a contact on the SOQ. Is that right? But without any evidence no, that it's 51%. Uh, if a contractor is, um, the, and we, the language was on the RFQ earlier, if a contractor selects a subcontractor that is a maybe levy, whether they're self-certified or certified through one of the entities that, that were listed, we do ask for um, confirmation proof then you'd of have that to have, once the contract Yeah, you'd have to have their LLC agreement or something that says they're 51% owned by uh, a woman or a minority. That's right. Yeah, that's self- that self-certification uh, does not vet companies in that fashion. Well, that, yeah. That yeah. The certification that's offered through uh, MDA, uh, MDOT, SBA, and so forth, those provide that vetting because, as I stated, once you submit their application online, you, it then uh, it, it compiles a list of documents, one of which is your letters of incorporation, your uh, tax returns. There are documents that you then will have to provide to us so that we can complete your review 
and issue that that, that yeah, certificate. So, so there, yeah, with, with certified in the state of Mississippi, there there are vetting that's done to to ensure that so companies if are who they are. Contractor looking at the minority uh, businesses to include in an SOQ. Uh, when you, if you went to that other magic site, uh, you would want to uh, kind of dig a little bit deeper into their background and make sure that they had the, the right qualifications. So, in case you did get the contract, you would have the proper verification for the certification. Um, and, and you know, I'll say this, you know, j just as a as a resource, if you're looking for a company that's minority certified here in the state of Mississippi, uh, our directory on our certification site would would be the would the be best. It would be the best application. Right. As I kind of stated when I was sitting down, the self certification is really flagged towards uh, uh, tracking the expenditure exactly. report. It's the annual report that we get that helps that be the most comprehensive. If everyone is flagged in that, then that says, okay, the numbers we have here are more accurate. Uh, but as a, as a prime contractor, if you're looking to connect with, with minority-owned companies, there are actually a lot of resources. Uh, you know, the MMBR.org is also a resource uh, that you can take a look at. But specifically, if you're looking for certified companies, uh, our, our directory is, is a good source. And then MDOT has a, has a directory as well. So uh, th th there's a, a number of different avenues where you can uh, identify, you know, vetted certified companies in that area. So Thank is, you. Is the certified database for MBA free to access? Oh, yes. Okay. Everything is free. <laughs> yeah, all our programs, are, you know, except for when you get into the financing part of it, uh, all of our programs are, are free programs uh, for participants. Um, you can go to the, the certification website and there's a, a different uh, area where it says directory search. And you can go there and uh, there's a, a page where you can put in different parameters uh, in terms of, of searching that site. Uh, we can go back quickly to that page and uh, I can just kind of show you what it looks like. I know we're getting short on time here. Should be back just one page, maybe not. But um, it, it, yeah, it's a very quick search that you can do, and then you can search by via uh, next codes, business name, uh, where location, where they're located. This is the the, the page of the uh, directory search. So this is the page for the ones that have been vetted. This is not that's the correct. Self okay. That's correct. Yep. And uh, so if you know a company name, you can put that in there. But if you're looking for companies in a certain area, put that in there as well. And then at the bottom, it says generate a report. And once you generate that report, or you can do minority owned, and it'll print, it'll generate a report for all the minority owned companies or for all the women owned companies in the system. And it'll be all the companies there. And then you can, uh, you can actually print that via PDF and have it. So again, it's kind of a, a resource for prime contractors to, to locate certified companies that have gone through the process. Good question, any other questions? I think we're getting pretty close. Yeah, uh, I talked about the model contractor program. This is more information on that. Uh, it was endorsed by the Surety and Fidelity Association of America. So, you know, when it was formed, again, the goal is to get more companies bonded Get the, give them the greater ability to take on larger projects that are gov that in the government you have to have that bonding component. So um, it, again, it's been a very nice program. Uh, other parts of the country have duplicated it. Mississippi is actually a leader in providing this program. So that's a, a full list of, of uh, pretty much what we've talked about uh, from the uh, business registry, the PTAC, the uh, certification program loans, bonding, model contractor, capital access, and then the statewide diversity initiative is, is the expenditure report that we review every year with your agents. And, and yeah, now this is the conclusion, thankfully, right? Uh, this is all our contact information. Uh, our main office is in the Wolf Oak Building in Jackson. Mississippi.org is the main MDA website. And then uh, our division is on there under minority and small business development. And then if you're interested in setting up an appointment with a contract procurement specialist, the Mississippi Procurement Technical Assistance Network, you can go to, to uh, mscpc.com and you can actually contact our, our counselors around the state. Obviously the local office is probably the best for, for most of you here, I could assume. 
and uh, you can set up an appointment and go by and see them and help get yourself enrolled in MAGIC and uh, SAM, as well as start your technical assistance program for, for uh, government contracting. Any other questions? You guys have been a great audience. Very, 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 very good questions, that's for sure. Thank you again, and uh, I think we're going to be outside at the table for a while, so if you need, if you have any uh, individual specific questions, feel free to stop by, and we can see how we can assist. Thank you.